We are live here, GW Smoke Break TV. It's a long time coming. I'm with my fellow comrade and friend that I definitely admire and respect, uh, Jackson. You know what I'm saying? All you guys know this guy is mean, Gene. Um, so again, without further ado, I just want to dive right in, man, into the into the marijuana multiverse. Um, Jackson, for those out there that don't know who you are, can we get a quick introduction, please? Um, I, uh, am Jackson known as Mean Gene from Freeborn Selection Seeds. Um, and, uh, I play with plants and make seeds and, um, am, uh, in the cannabis multiverse, I guess here. <laughs> Heck yeah, dude. You're one of the pioneers, you know what I'm saying? For sure. Um, now, man, um, you know, so much has been going on, so much has been happening. And if we start backwards, like just take it back to a few days ago, I believe you were present at the uh, Eagle Clash. I was there at the Eagle Clash, man. It was awesome. It was a cool party. Um, it was, uh, there was a lot of people there and it's a cool thing because you know that everybody that's there is, um, is super into weed. So, you know, like pretty much anybody that, that flagged me down, like I knew that they were heavy weed heads and they were um, enthusiastic about it. So like everybody's really fun to talk to and see what they got going. And uh, uh, the vibe was great. Brandon does definitely like he's, he's on top of his stuff and um, you know, good food and good music was playing and everything was set up nice. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, he manages it well and it, and uh you know they call it the ego clash and it's probably like kind of the most egoless uh weed event that there is because everybody that's there knows that every, you know you're not sh you ain't showing off for nobody there you know what i mean like everybody who's there you're like oh you know these guys got some crazy some crazy weed and crazy hash and rosin and um you know seeds and everything else that was going on it's really a neat a neat vibe our buddy uh our buddy from up in humboldt with the killer killer uh fungi were up there and um everything was it was it was cool man cool scene yeah yeah uh 100 and the name ego clash when i first heard the name i remember i'm like what is it whoa that sounds heavy it sounds serious ego clash and i agree you know at, at events um that i've been to i I haven't been to an ego clash, you know, uh, there's a lot of pride and it's not competitive. It's a lot of love and a lot of giving away. And I think Brandon was really uh, creative and maybe ingenious in, in how he put those two words together. Cause um, I think when we're working on our product and me just being an indoor weed drawer, you know, I do take a lot, a lot of pride, hell of pride. Now how we express it, I think is different in terms of I'm not going to run up on you and be like, yo, my shit's so good, dude. It, it, you know, your shit looks like trash compared to mine. Uh, um, so that's what that's what I was hoping to participate in, you know. But we didn't. I thought the gates were going to be closed after twelve. Um, so I didn't. I didn't go. I wasn't able to make it until like the evening time. Okay, I, I showed up like but, uh, two thirty. Okay. Yeah. I, I, okay. I showed up like on the later side for what it was, and uh, you know, it was. It was cool. I even my my ticket had expired and I pulled up and I was like, oh, I like I seen I seen Brandon's dad over there. I'm like trying to like, wait, wait, you know, and luckily the guy who was at the gate, you know, I was like, he was like, uh, well, well, what's your name? And I was like, I mean, Gene, like I'm invited, you know, and he was like, oh, mean Gene. All right, cool. And luckily, you know, the dude knew who I was because I was like sitting there and my buddy, my buddies were with me behind me in the car and uh, in the other car and I was like oh man and we had somebody had like double parked weird and it was a big run around on parking so we had to come way back and I was just like oh man come on like can we hopefully we can get in here because we'd come all the way down but everybody was super mellow um it wasn't you know they have like good security but not asshole security and uh the vibes you know everything was was real straight man so how does it work Jackson I mean I saw a picture of you and like you have a bag on you you know I, I'm sure that people want to give you their work in the same way that I brought back some stuff from the UK for you. Um, and I know you probably get, got some stuff to give out. Is it like every event, you know, are you always uh, like never cease to be amazed by what you come home with? 
Um, yeah, I mean, the more people that I, that I like, uh, interact with, the more, you know, the more people bring me stuff. Like when I had a booth, like at the Emerald cup or when I was set up at a table, I set up at sticker farmers table last year, people can find me easier. And then it's like, Whoa, okay. You wind up with all this stuff. And I still wound up with some nice, I wound up with some nice rosin and some cool seeds. Um, uh, hummingbird Hills uh autos i got some i got some good um some good whale oil rosin i got some good um whoa, you know, whoa, whoa. whale oil rosin you please explain this sounds that sounds it's, pretty cool it's just a brand it's just a brand you know it's a brand whale it's oil. cool that has like the it has like the this uh cool like native logo um and it's just some fire rosin that i got from a dude who who hooked me up and i just remember those because i was just looking at them on the table and i was like oh that's cool you know um as far as like the branding and the, the logo and stuff was it was pretty it was nice and uh you know then uh, there's you know i wound up with a little bit of other stuff but not not as much as i would get if i was set up stationary because like you're walking around and people don't know who you like when i'm there i like i come home and i'm on instagram and i'm looking at everyone's posts and i'm like, oh that was so and so that was so and so once i see them like post a picture of themselves there I'm like, oh, I would have, you know, but you don't know who people are and you're not just going to walk up to every single person and go, so who are you? And what do you do? You know, like, <laughs> you can, but you know, like, like you can get away with it because you're doing media stuff, you know, and I probably should more um, just because like when, when you're there, everybody, I mean, the Emerald Cup was like that too. Like pretty much anybody who you go and talk to, like they're super into weed. So you're probably, you know, you, you're right off the bat, you're going to be cool with them on that level where you got a shared interest, you know, but, um, you know, I just, I just, uh, walked around and ever since I've been going to like parties in general, I've always brought a big bag of weed and then I just give it all away, you know? Um, and then, uh, you know, I do the same thing with seeds. I just bring a bunch of weed and a bunch of seeds and I walk around and then as soon as if like I talk to anybody for a minute, I'm like, hold up, you know, let me give you a bud. Or if I'm showing someone some weed and someone's looking over my shoulder, like, ooh, can I smell that? I'm like, here, take a, take a stick of weed, you know? I just bring like a bunch of like sticks of untrimmed weed with like the leaves knocked off, you know? Um, and then, uh, you know, it's it's not a big deal to grow it and it's not a big deal to, um, to hand it out, it's, it's fun. That's like my, you know, fun, fun thing. If it's, if you know people are like interested and they like the smell and everything, then like here, take them, you know, take some. It's a fun thing to do with weed. And when you grow it, it doesn't matter because it's all, you know, it's whatever you you pay, you know, to, to take one bag and set it aside. It's like, oh, it's just a bag, it's just a bag of weed. It's like giving somebody tomatoes or something. If, you know, if I had to buy it, I'd be like, sorry, I can't afford to hand it out, you know. But when you grow it, you have to give it away. It's great. No, you're one of the fellows that taught me that, uh, giving away weed and how it's uh, a gesture that is rarely forgotten, you know, uh, in the opposite sense. People kind of cherish that, and uh, they they definitely, you know, leaves an imprint on their memory. It's what it did for me. So in Jamaica, I definitely gave away some weed, and I've been the lucky recipient of, you know, you giving out some herb, and you've hooked me up on multiple occasions with root beer seeds, and I have some cool stuff to share on the show later on that you've given me as of late, some stuff that will be available on the website. Um, but ultimately, <clears throat> I want to say, um, did you have a learning moment, you know, from a certain conversation or observation, you know, maybe uh, evolution of the game or, uh, you know, certain terping profile or I can't say, you know? I mean, the awards themselves, I feel like are always like a little bit of a, eye opener because you know you go and you go okay what's gonna win this is gonna be cool you're gonna find out about some good new weed or whatever like the sun grown category this year was won by uh lemon cherry gelato and people will look at that and they'll go oh well that's bullshit and it's like well everybody was there that entered whatever they entered with whatever name it had and they all voted that this this thing that is basically like what's the most popular in the market in the area you know i may be all over the place but in california like if you have lemon cherry gelato you're good you know it's gonna you're gonna be able to do something with it and um you know it just goes to show that even though a lot of people have that cut and a lot of people probably entered it or could have entered it the guys who really grow and really you know 
pour their energy into it and and know their stuff they can still win with something that everybody has access to they didn't have any crazy proprietary genetics they just grew it really well they weren't it wasn't even like super it's not that small of a batch like i mean it is by some standards but like you know they had a good little amount of the weed and they were able to enter it and still beat everything and you go well i mean if it was not good at all it's not gonna win by everybody's votes putting it in and of course there's a natural bias to what people consider good weed and what what's popular does influence that to a degree but you know, if it's just all hype and because so-and-so said it's good, it's not going to win in a blind contest against a bunch of other people's weed. A lot of people probably saw it and were like, damn, what's this? And probably had the cut or had had the weed before. Never seen it grown like that. Because, you know, these couple guys, Turp Mansion and, uh, and Ridgeline, like took second. And uh, the other guy, I think I might- Exotic Farms. Exotic farms. I, I like, I don't know. I might know him, but I don't know, like right off when I saw it, I was like, okay, I'm not sure that I know this dude, but like, I know, I know Ridgeline. And like, when you get his weed, if you give his weed to somebody and you give them a bunch of different weeds, they're always like, damn, what was that one? You know, what was that? What was that? Uh, that Lance, you know, it's green lantern runs, it's fire. And uh, it's undeniable, but you look at it and you go, well, it's like a gas mixed with the candy gas. And, I'm sure a lot of people could have it and not necessarily um, be able to have like the craziest weed ever. But, you know, he he's if you ask any of his friends from Humboldt, they're like, dude, that dude's always had the best weed since we were really young. Like, yeah, he just really <laughs> hard to grow really good weed and he's really enjoys it and is enthusiastic. And um, so, you know, that's kind of a, that's a teachable thing because I couldn't help but think like, oh, and there's going to be some kind of crazy new thing somebody's going to have and that's going to give them an edge and it's like not if you maybe if you give the right people something like that yeah but they can take something everyone's already seen and win you know you know what the edge is and what you and jason gelman have in common and cody came from exotic farms uh i, I can't say if homeboy from turt mansion is this i think luke is a first generation operator uh your mom uh influenced your career you know and you you've talked about it here and there that'd be a cool direction to go in as much as you want to talk because you know i understand like ayana gregory's dad he won't say shit about nothing it's really cool um yeah, now yeah, yeah. jason gelman his dad as we all know you know he's got a cool relationship with his pops i love seeing them together and it's my understanding i believe they bred the lance together but that's definitely uh having a, a edge up on the competition when he grew up in the gizame like that um, so any, any responses, sir? Yeah. I mean, over, you know, of course, the more time you have with the plant, the more, more knowledge you're going to get. But funny enough, you know, like I was just talking about that. Who was I talking about that with? I was just talking about that with Casey O'Neill, uh, yesterday. And, um, what a lot of people don't like realize is that all the way until, like, basically we were adults by the time most people who were the generation before us like had very much weed. So like me growing up with weed, it would be like, yeah, there's a, there's this little bit of weed it's done in the fall and then it's gone. It doesn't, you don't always have weed sitting around trying to figure out like, what's this, what's that, what's good about it. Everybody only had a little bit of weed. It was really hard to grow weed in the eighties and the nineties. When the two thousands came in and the medical came in, everybody was able to really start getting nitty gritty with it. And that was when it was like, all right, now people start to learn like, okay, this is how you make full melt on a silk screen. This is how you make water hash full melt. This is how you make BHO blasting in like tubes and shit. You know what I mean? All sketchy purging in a bowl out in the sun and shit. You know what I mean? Like goofy stuff like that. But before that, like we wouldn't even have weed really in the summer. It would be like picking through shake for little buds or, you know, trying to get a little bit of this or a little bit of that. And even though like, you know, we we had weed and we had the plants and everything, it wasn't really until more my generation or the very like the generation before us, like people who are my mom's age and older than her they basically were just like growing weed, trying to get some weed 
And then if they got weed back then, like weed was all good. It's green. It's like, it smells good. It's nice. And like, there wasn't, nobody was ever going to be sitting there going, well, I think this should score 82 points and this should score that or whatever it was like breaking it down. Like dudes like, um, dudes like Ridgeline, they're like, you know, maybe his dad was way deep on that level. I don't, I don't know him, but generally that generation wasn't like, haven't you seen his mustache? Uh, this is his mustache. Oh, so they say it always got one of those hippie seventies, thick ass mustaches, dude. Yeah, Freak brothers mustache. Yeah. No, Something I like that. Yeah. I don't know him, but, um, but, but it's a trip because like a lot of, a lot of all of this is really new. So you're still seeing people make these big strides in figuring out how to produce quality, how to produce it at scale. I mean, Turp Mansion is masterful in all aspects of production, handling, curing everything they're doing is like uh is on a level that it's not like oh yeah i mean he like you said he's first generation but even if you were fourth generation all this stuff is new so as he's figuring it out yeah he's learning some stuff he's got some people i'm sure that are putting him up on some game here and there but for but a, a lot of it is that he's basically just trying to be super effective and super efficient and um, it might actually be an advantage that he wasn't taught anything when he was really young because he basically came in with the background as like an efficiency expert and said, huh, these guys do this. This isn't the right way to do that. This guys do this. That's not the right way to do that. Whereas like somebody like me, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've I've watched like a bunch of old timers grow. You toss some stuff in the dirt, you grow some weed, comes out good. And then over the years myself. I figured out like, all right, here's the little things that happen where we ruin it. And I've been able to like dial that in. But um, but that information now, as somebody who just started, all that information is available. If you're actually hungry for information, you can track it down and ask the right people and go, okay, what's what's going on with this? And so, uh, you know, I, I almost feel like the people who are learning fresh, like Turp Mansion, have an advantage as well if they have the drive and the ambition you know and also you know i i came up in a time when you know you you grow enough and you don't want to like be the big guy on the block because you'll get popped you'll bring down the heat on everybody he doesn't have that stigma he's it's not in his head like oh enough is enough it's like no i'm gonna go big i'm gonna do it proper uh, and he scales up in an organic way to where and i don't mean like organic food or whatever i mean just like the way it happens it happens because he's like i can do a little more and it still works i can do a little more and it still works so he's winning competitions with weed that's grown more than most of people from my age group and above me they won't they won't even like it won't even click in their head because you're like oh no you can't grow that much weed and have it be perfect and it's like yeah he, he can because he's scientific he's calculated and he's clocking he's clocking yeah. dude yeah and i mean it's just you know so there there is that advantage to it um but yeah, that's an interesting aspect of like, you know, uh, people will think like, oh, you have this huge advantage because you were around weed from young. But we being around weed over the last 20 years was a lot different than being around weed for the previous 20 years. Being around weed in the 90s was kind of like everything was very exciting and sometimes it came out good and sometimes it didn't. And some people like really had the right place to do it and could pull it off properly um but it there wasn't like a whole lot to go off of from back then if you talk to people who are like older than my mom they're all it's all pot it's all good whatever you know like it's not they're not on the same level of being like um getting all milly with the details and everything which is what it takes now to be um competitive but me and my peer group got a little bit um from like like my, my, I have a couple buddies where their parents were like very much connoisseurs and super into it. And so they got past some information. I got information from them. We kind of over the years, like broke it down, like, oh, okay, this is what they're talking about. This is what's going on. Learned hands on and everything. But I would say like that people who are um, older than me is there's less and less if you go back 
of people who are really super detail oriented, you know, like Ted from Canna Country Farms. He's one of the real OGs where when people would be like, oh, yeah, you're the man. You can grow so good and blah, blah, blah. I'd be like, you don't know people like Ted because Ted is like the real like the man from back in the day, you know what I mean? And like, I always was hoping he'd come out of the, come out of the woods. And then when he did, boom, he won the Emerald, you know? So, you know, but like he said, when he was in high school, there was the stigma <laughs> him where he, he was like, didn't want to be looked at as a stoner. He couldn't tell people he smoked, you know? So once you get back before that, there's not a lot of, you know, communication going on because you know, you tell people you're smoking, they they don't even want to hear it. No, I wanted to mute my mic real quick. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna check my connection real quick. I think I might have it on the on the wrong thing here. I can hear you, see so you just fine. <laughs> you know, I was gonna ask you. <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right. We good? Yeah, yeah. Since the first moment you spoke, no, thank you. About Ted, I immediately noticed a, a respect and admiration. <laughs> and for me, I'm I'm pretty deductive, dude. I'm I'm pre pretty intuitive when it comes to sniffing out a fellow professional operator. You know, just like a a skateboarder can sniff out a fellow pro skateboarder or skateboard enthusiast. Center. It's kind of a natural, I don't say attraction, but kind of a magnetism. You just, you know, like you said, we're into the same things. <laughs> so with Ted, the first time I seen the guy, I was like, oh shit, this guy's a serious operator. I didn't know nothing about him. I didn't know his name was Ted. It was at the 2019 Emerald Cup. I believe you and I had an interview that day. We did. And uh, I just like to know in in your from your perspective why you give him so much credit <laughs> well i mean there's a lot of layers to that and some of it is like is like personal stuff that's you know various connections between different people that like you can't like paint the whole picture but like to put it like more simply on my personal level i met ted when i was nine years old and he was a high schooler at that point. He's older than me by maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure, but maybe. Eight Dude, years what was he like back then, bro? That's rare. Excuse me for interrupting you. Uh, what, I mean, how was it? Because now he's got this crazy beard, right? Yeah, yeah. Was he a roughneck back then? Was he? How was he? I mean, he, he was into sports. He's really athletic. He likes to drive real fast. He's a man's man. He's like, uh, you know, but he's a sweetheart. He's a really good dude. He's super solid. He's never... You know, you'll never hear anybody say like anything bad on him about him doing any kind of anything foul to anybody. He's just really, really solid, really cool. And uh, and he's charismatic. Like, you know, I've literally met people who reminded me of him over the years and instantly thought they were cool because they reminded me of him, which maybe was bullshit. Maybe they weren't even very cool, but because they, they reminded me of him, I, I would naturally be like, oh, this dude, this dude's cool, you know? Like, I got a cousin, my cousin Mike is like that. If I meet somebody and they remind me of my cousin Mike, I just instantly think they're solid. And maybe they're not, maybe it's foolish, but like, I think it's a vibe thing. And and uh, it's I've never been proven otherwise to say that it is bullshit. Logically, it makes no sense. But I think energetically, maybe it does, it does work. But Ted's just one of those dudes who like, um, back in the day, when everyone else would be out of weed, Ted would stop by and he'd have like an ounce in his pocket and he'd roll like a five gram fatty and like smoke half of it, leave half of it in the ashtray and set a big ass bud like this big on the table. And you'd just be like, holy shit. Like when people just didn't, like when there was no weed around, like he always had weed, you know? And, and he was one of the first people who I saw go check on like little, little tiny starts and like you know touch them make sure they were sturdy make sure there's nothing going on with the roots and the stem when they're little and look at them and go oh, i don't like that one pull it out oh, i don't want like that one pull it out and set the pots aside and like have all of this stuff just be like these perfect like beautiful starts like you know when the first true leaves come out and the plants are already like this wide you know because the leaves are like little just boom poking out like thumbs off and there's only 
those just like what I call like the canoes or the bunny ears. They're just like, boom. And they're just fat and huge. And I was like, damn, these are, this is crazy. Like they can look like this. He was planting the starts in bigger pots, not in six packs, you know, putting them in whatever six inch pots or something. And like, just looking and being like, wow, this, this dude's like kind of doing stuff with stuff where you could tell he was like, <clears throat> there was these subtle, subtle levels to the things that he was doing that showed like experience and stuff when I was only, you know, whatever, 15 or something, <clears throat> you know? And uh, he's just always been, you know, he's one of the first people who I knew who was able to like grow indoor and be like, and like get a real yield where you're like, damn, you can get that like on a light. And he always had like, just the hugest buds that looked so perfect and smoked so good. And, um, you know, and he was just one of those first, first dudes who I saw really doing that when there wasn't that many people who were doing that and achieving things at like that fine of a level, you know? And so, uh, I've just always, you know, on a weed level, I've just always had a, a huge amount of respect for him as like, a, as a, um, you know, like, a as a, as an OG, you know, a dude that's, that's older than me. And then, you know, uh, the other like layers of stuff that I'm talking about with stuff is that like he was one of the first people who was in a circle of people who were growing things like what we call perp, which was like Burmese indica. And he has like the knowledge of that. Like the other day I asked him, I'm like, hey, um, you're from Leggett. When was the first time you saw the Hindu clone? I'm trying to figure out maybe how far it goes back. I heard of it in the mid 90s. When did you first hear about it? He's like, I just started high school. It had to be at least as far back as 88. That clone was already a thing that was renowned in Leggett when he started high school, you know? And so I'm in like, okay, so I know, that dude, that's so I know the clone I'm holding dates back to 88 because of Ted. And there's not a lot of people who you can check in with and be like, hey, what's up with this? What's up with that? He's been able to tie together stories that I had that I had wondered about for 30 years and then you ask him about it and he's like yeah it's like this and you're okay shit so you know he's he's uh um you know but but he but he's humble as hell he doesn't think anything of it he was just there he did it he tried hard he worked hard he's smart he's observant you know to him like it's not like he's like oh dude I'm the man you know he's he's very cool man it's just you know for somebody like me who grew up like watching what he was doing um it was like always like you know aspirational to be like oh i want to know about weed like somebody like ted you know there's other dudes like that he's one of those dudes you know it's funny couple things one uh a little bit after the emerald cup ted did me a favor you know i'll never forget that favor that he did me um and i did right by him you know of course uh and then also of all the interviews i did at the 2019 emerald cup you know I figured, dude, if I smoke a joint and just puff down, it'll be it'll be good, you know. I really enjoyed doing that during my interviews, some of my first interviews, as you may remember. And Ted already had a a little log rolled up, and of all the people, you know how everybody's got their style of how they light up and smoke. This guy, in my mind, for some reason, I'm like dude, this guy's hitting it like a like a gangster, like like a G, like he's tough puffing it hard, like. I mean, it's on the YouTube channel, you know, for everybody to see. I'm sure you may have seen it, but that's something that I'll never forget. It's the first time I met Ted. Um, so, so it's funny because we're talking about going backwards, right? And, and I meant like going backwards in time, starting with the present. And so, you know, you're talking about 88 and Leggett, and this is Northern Mendo. And uh, first, what can you share about Leggett? Because... Of all my years, it's my understanding that I've been driving right past Leggett. Yeah. You know, I go to, I've been to Standish Hickey, I've been to the Peg House, but Leggett is south yeah. of there, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you're there, you know, you're you're kind of in Leggett, like because that's the closest place to it. Um, but yeah, Leggett's really small. It's more of an area. Um, you know, if you haven't been to Leggett, you probably haven't been to the drive-through tree. You ever drive through the tree? You got to no. take your camera and go drive through the tree, dude. Go smoke a big fatty or a bong or something while you're driving through the tree. Like people will trip if they don't know what it is. It's a tree. You drive through it. It's that big, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's a cool little area. There's like all these cool redwood carvings in the woods now they've done over the last five or 10 years. Um, there's a beautiful pond. It's this beautiful space. Um, 
it's just like i mean you want to go have a picnic or just go like hang out um if you're mellow and you can handle like your shrooms you could walk around there on shrooms it would be amazing it's just a really cool um the vibe there's crazy it's a really cool place it's probably been inhabited by people for 15,000 years um it's just this really beautiful little place in this valley and there was this one tree and it just had big enough weird enough branches that they didn't mill it and cut it down and they um it had been burnt to an extent and they basically cut out the middle of the bottom and you can drive a car through that tree and it's called the drive through tree and it's in Leggett. And that's like the thing in Leggett that is like, you know, the real famous um, thing, but there's beautiful places at the river there. Um, you know, there's a, I think uh, Brandon, I'm not sure if it's there because I haven't been, but I know that it wasn't that long ago. He told me to come up. They have a pizza place there. Um, Brandon and his dad and stuff, you know, um so like you got to hit that if, if they if they still have it i assume they do i just i haven't made it there um you know the peg house and stand to shaky that's that's basically there and the peg house is great that's been there forever and um stand to shaky there's a big cliff there it's like 75 feet tall people jump off of that um beautiful swimming hole down there like really nice grover redwoods there um and then you know just a oh, lot of i was history. gonna ask you see when i Oh no! Excuse me, Jackson. Uh, you know, Stan and Shiki, I camped there twice, and it's like a horseshoe kind of campground. But there's actual oh. hiking trails you can go down. You're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go down. So if you head straight through it and you stay to the right, there's a trail that goes down, and it goes to a beautiful swimming hole. That um, you know, it's just it's just a really nice piece of river, and like I said, there's a big cliff and people you know like i'm sure if you talk to ted he'd be oh yeah i've jumped off it 50 times you know as far as i would as far as i would guess if he said he hasn't jumped off it i'd be shocked i won't jump off the shit you know what i mean like you give me like 30 feet or something and eh, i'll go off i ain't jumping off 75 feet you know like even when i was younger and now i'm like no you know i'm good on like a 20 footer or something i'm not jumping um but but people do. People go to Stand and Shaky. It's kind of like a locally famous, like, you know, if you know people jump off rocks, you're like, you ever jump at Stand and Shaky? And, you know, you'd be surprised sometimes the people who have and haven't, you know, sometimes people are like a lot younger or older than you would think or whatever. But, you know, it's a it's a cool little cool thing because the river up here is a big thing for pastime in the summer, especially if you grew up like poor, you know, like it's like, oh, go to the river. It's it's awesome. Dude. You know, it's really cool. <clears throat> okay, time traveling some more. Speaking of poor, we went to Pakistan, and uh, I was thinking about this earlier. I'm like, you get to see your friends move around, do their thing, and the word that came to mind is sedentary. I think sedentary means to be in one place, uh, and it's like the legend of the man on the mountain, who he had exerted his power and he, you know, rule his kingdom. And I think, you know, especially after a book that I read that Kevin actually turned me on to um, uh, the, some, the samurai scrolls, Shogun scrolls, the Shogun scrolls, uh, your, our kingdoms comprise of, you know, our families, our ambitions doesn't have to be literally a fucking country or, or what have you. And so um, what I'm asking you is, you know, you're, you're watching our world develop and us to be able to communicate overseas, travel overseas, gather seed stock and so forth. <clears throat> Um, have you thought about this next evolution of the game? And I'm going to influence, I guess, your response by asking you if you know what a triploid is. Um, I mean, I do. I don't really know, like, the details of, um, you know, the advantages other than what I see when people are selling them and showing uh, the crops and everything like i don't you know i don't it's not really like i'm i'm totally uh um in every sense i'm a traditional breeder i'm not a modern breeder i just look at plants and i do things with them now in and of that i do a lot of different stuff i do a lot of different test crosses i try to keep males use them on different plants to get a picture of what the male is um, keep the males around and check them out and 
they try to make them get resin and see what they smell like and um you know try different combinations and recreate things go back and redo stuff but as far as as far as doing anything that's like that uh, the most weird thing i've done with plants is making feminized seeds which i don't really think <laughs> is that weird because in the right situations and i think probably in a lot of wild fields it's it's happening all the time like i think land races are probably have a lot of feminized seeds in them people don't realize it because they didn't realize like oh this one seeded itself that got mixed into all the stuff and probably where a certain amount of the intersects comes from in land races when you start off with them and um you know it's like a natural mechanism of the plant but we're we're you know um coaxing it out with a little bit of trickery but um as far as like any of the real crazy stuff i haven't been i haven't done any of it you know like um there's definitely um a lot of advantage to a lot of stuff people are starting to use crispr i saw somebody posted like oh my buddy's doing crispr editing on plants and there's all kinds of stuff like that that's that's cool i, I don't even know the process of how they do what you're asking about i i don't even i haven't asked anybody about it i mean i'm sure i'll learn about it i'm so once i find out about something i'm like all right i I need to learn about it, but I've only found out about it in the last six months or so that that was a thing people were doing. I think it's Humboldt Seeds has been posting how nice, um, you know, my daughter was saying, oh, these fields are so beautiful. These plants are so impressive. And I'm like, oh, cool. I'm curious. I'm not really against anything um, like that. I like to see people doing everything. Just I always have like I always have these certain things that I'm already working on and incorporating new things is definitely just doing a feminized run was a big challenge, but, um, but, I, but I'm curious about it. And I think, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be some cool stuff that could happen when people start realizing when you realize that the mechanisms of how genes are transferring and you start to play with those, then you're going to reach levels that you're not going to reach doing what I'm doing. And, um, you know, uh, I, if the, if they make sense to me and I like the idea, you know, I won't let it pass me by. I'll go ahead and, and, and get into it. But for the time being, I'm uneducated about it and I haven't, I haven't dipped into it, you know? Well, I'm in the mistake of asking you two questions at once. So I apologize. We'll get back to, you know, land race and, and the modernization and how it's interesting, how to go forward, you can take a step back in time to do it. Uh, but see this bag right here, just to stay on topic, um, homeboy, I forget his name. Is it Ben from humble seed company, tall guy? Uh, he's always working with Nat. I interviewed him at Spanibus, but he's with humble seed company, seen him at the Emerald cup on Saturday. He hands me this bag. I ask him of course, what a triploid is and to best, you know, my best recollection is something to the effect of it's a, a modern breeding technique that's been done. That's like done in other. It's been done before in other industries, other sectors, you can say. And basically, it adds an extra chromosome. It's like you breed it to, you do this technique enough, boom, boom, boom. Like a Jason Bourne, like it just everything gets tuned up. It's like more vigor, more growth. And he was really talking uh, like it's this next thing, you know. And I wish I could have put it more into words, but it's like getting an extra, like as humans, we have certain chromosomes and plants have X amount of chromosomes. This puts like an extra <clears throat> so I got like an extra chromosome in there, which it, it puts makes it hog wild or some shit. It, it puts an extra, my understanding of it is it puts an extra set of chromosomes, right? So like with humans, you know, uh, you hear like 23 and me, that's like breaking down everything that's sitting on your chromosomes, right? And so you're going all of a sudden, like if plants have, I can't remember what they have, 28. I don't even see, I don't even know this shit. But then no, no, no. we'll say 28 but, for the plans, I, I'm going to say out of my head, have 28 in my multiverse. Fucking, and there's 20 in the multiverse. Am I dead fucking wrong? Maybe I can't fucking remember. It doesn't I, matter. It's the multiverse. It doesn't matter to me because I'm not a modern breeder. I don't look at the chromosomes and see which genes are sitting on here and how they're going to pass and what's grouped together. I do that all. Through don't lie to us, Jackson. Mechanics of doing all the shit. Right. But my understanding is that all of a sudden you would, you would go from 28 to 42. You know, all of a sudden you'd be going, okay, now we're adding a full set over here because usually they're in pairs. 
and that's how everything is going and you're trying to match these things up you know um so i don't really get that's what i mean i'm totally uneducated about all that shit i know about like plants and what i do with them and how it Me works too. how things pass and what i have and then explore things and figure out what's going on with them but as far as this i'm like i don't even know what the mechanism is for them to develop this extra set and then um like is it compatible with regular plants that have the two sets <laughs> or now are they naturally not going to be able to be seeded by anything that is not three sets because <clears throat> have an, I, I don't understand it at all so i have like i said I, once i find out about something like yeah i'm going to study it and look at it and, and find out about it because as soon as you're in a conversation with someone about it you're like wow this is trippy like just the feeling of not understanding something, it like, it makes you want to know, okay, so what does this mean? How does this work? You know? And so um, it's, uh, you know, it's something that's above what I do. You know, I can tell you like how things grow, what they smell like, like, is this particular thing in some cases I know, is it a single a, a single gene controlling a trait and it's recessive. Like I know certain things, um, but like things like this, they're just way above my head, dude. And and that's, what's cool is that there's people who were doing things and putting in all the work to where, and with the internet now, it's like, I can learn about this tomorrow. And I would have an answer to be like, Whoa, so check this out. But at the moment I'm like, no, all I know is that I basically saw, Nat's daughter saying this field is this and they're really exceptional and look at them and I was like cool it looks neat I don't understand the advantages I don't understand the disadvantages I don't know the mechanism for creating them I am completely in the dark at this point and then you, if you talk to me next week maybe I'll be like oh dude so this shit's crazy you know <laughs> maybe I'll look at it and be like I don't I don't see the fucking point bro just make some seats but I don't know because I'm I, because I'm not educated on it. You know, it's it's pretty cool. Well, I don't see it as being above your head. I just see it see it as being like over here because <clears throat> on the, the other moment, side of that coin, it, it is. It's above my. Uh, you know, it's it's more complex than what I'm doing. It so I consider it. It's it's past what I'm doing. You know. Well, well when I when I completely thought maybe you'll agree, but what I'm saying is that on the flip side of that coin is a breeder's sense of intuition, and and what does that mean to me? I think that there's a potential for magic between the breeder and the plant, a relationship, a, a love ballad that uh, is a totally different energy that science doesn't put a finger on. Not sure if it can. And an example of that, in my opinion, Jackson, is like Emerald Spirit Botanicals. Joseph's mom is the chief breeder over there, head breeder. And she like she totally does her thing, man. And, and they're getting some wild stuff, some wild shit. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Um, I'm not sure that I, I don't know. Uh, oh, okay. Wow. So I mean, to put it more into perspective, uh, the mom really takes on this feminine approach and she really does this. I, I don't want to call it a ritual, but she presents the males to the females and, and she like opens it up to let them decide or she really just, you know, it's it's the craziest thing. Again, I wish I could put it into words better, but, but it's intuitive as opposed to as opposed to database or yeah. yes. And as a result, they're getting like high THCVs or CBGs, like like the highest in California. They're okay, no, no, no. Bodies. I'm fully. I I'm just I'm terrible. Sometimes I forget. I know people in real life, and then I forget what their companies are called or or whatever it is. But I, I'm pretty sure they're right around the block from me. And. uh Joseph, yeah. he's got red hair, you know. Yeah, and, long and, hair. And is this uh, is this Katie or is the one of the ladies' names like Katie? I think his mom's or, main name might be Katie. She's really shy. She doesn't. Yeah, I curly to. hair. Curly uh, hair. I know Joseph's got a brother. Uh, I know it's okay, a family man. business. But I just know that I know a lady who's doing. She has like the highest. Um, they have like the pink goddess boost pink boost goddess that's her yeah, yeah it's them. Yep. yeah i'm just you know like if it's not if i'm not directly like i'm not working with the seeds i don't so i try i know to, you exist in different multiverses i understand but okay. really really sweet lady and i know her in in real life and um 
And yeah, she basically was like, oh, there was these certain plants and they seemed special. And she tested them and they had a lot of THCV and she continued to do the same intuitive approach coupled with lab testing and was able to outdo what everybody in the world has done with THCV. And um, she says that she owes a lot of it to that intuitive approach. And she also gives credit to science for doing the lab testing. But, um, you know, I, the thing about plants is in that particular case, that's like exceptional. Like, you know, you got to go, okay, so is she, does she have like something that is there, like some type of synesthesia or some type of like, what does that mean? Synesthesia. synesthesia is something that in my opinion everybody has to a degree some people have it so heavy that they like i was joking the other day when i was hanging out with ted and we were sniffing jars and he was saying it smelled like a plant they have called number nine or something and he goes this smells like number nine and i go damn ted can smell numbers just fucking around you know <laughs> I, because because some people like do some people like there's like a famous guy That's who does funny. math problems and you ask him the most absurd math problem you know and he comes up with the answers out of his head and he can't do the math but he basically looks inside his head and he goes six three one five Two, and he keeps going and they ask him well how do you know where do these numbers come from and he goes they're just in my head he goes nine is very big and 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 six is like wavy and one has like polka dots and he goes i just see them and then they appear and then after i write them all down they're the answer to the math problem and so it's basically like a beneficial form of what people would call autism, like the Rain Man. Like, are you familiar familiar with the with the real life Rain Man? What his actual powers are? He can read a book, both pages at once, and I think it takes him like three seconds to read it. And he reads them both, and once he reads them, he never forgets them, and he remembers them. And you can ask, hey um in the bible uh this particular edition written by so and so published in this year um on page number whatever and this part what does line 43 say and he can tell you and he has a house full of books like a huge room look at look up the real life rain man and it's just incredible and he has a form of autism which makes him have trouble with normal day-to-day -day tasks and social cues and dealing with people. But he's way smarter than anybody on a level that makes it so that like IQ is a joke. Like, oh, IQ? Like, yeah, you'd have to reinvent the scale of what you judge intelligence on because of this, this guy. So when people tell me things that they're doing intuitively, I'm like, uh, in some cases, it might just be ego telling them that they're really good at something and, oh, I can just tell. But in some cases, if they actually have results, you have to wonder a little bit like, oh, does she have a little bit something different in her brain that allows her to see plants and the plants actually communicate with her the way that a book communicates with the rain man because our understanding of intelligence doesn't explain how somebody can know a whole library full of books word for word and be able to recall where the lines are not only does he remember the whole thing and can tell you what it says you can pick a line so as he read he obviously his brain also effortlessly counted the lines not only did they count them but catalog them so that everything's in his brain like a file cabinet so that you can look through his whole, and I'm talking like a high school library worth of books, and you can ask him any single line on any given page of any book he's ever read, and he can tell you, and he didn't read them again and again, he reads them right away, flips through the book. He reads like this, left, right, flip the page, left, right, flip the page, left, right, it's insane and they made a movie about him when i was a kid and it was famous and dustin hoffman and tom cruise but they don't show you what he can really do and when you see the real guy in real life on a video and they ask him questions it's insane there's a guy who bumped his head once different guy 
And ever since he bumped his head now, if you ask him what the weather was like on any day of his life, he can tell you what it was like. Really weird thing. Is it a talent? I don't know. But it's definitely some type of a, of a difference in the brain. The guy's totally normal otherwise. But he has this special thing with his brain. So, you know, uh, synesthesia is, is what the question was. Of course, I went fucking 20 minutes out. But synesthesia cool. is is when your brain does a similar thing. But like when you smell something, it smells like a color. Now, I personally think that everybody has some level of it because a lot of people can smell something and say, huh, I mean, we, we might learn it and you might learn that cinnamon candy is red and grape candy is purple and you smell grape <laughs> and you think it's purple. <clears throat> but at the same time, even if it's learned, there's still a relation in there, right? And so, like, for me, for myself, I'll smell things and they'll have, like, um, and I don't really think this is, like, unique to me. I don't think that, like, oh, I have a special form of synesthesia other people don't have. I think everybody does this to a certain level. Like, when you, when you smell something, you'll say it's a sharp smell or it's a dull smell or it's a warm smell or it's smells like these things that are not smells smells smell like things does it smell like garlic yeah you know what i mean does it smell like this yeah but people learn these things to where like people think purple weed a lot of purple weed they say it smells purple like they don't you don't really hear people smell weed and say it smells green but people relate these fruity things we learn like that these berry smells and you know, Concord grape and all these things. This is purple. If it's a drink and it smells like this, this drink would be purple. When you show somebody a soda and it's grape soda, but it's clear, it fucking trips out your brain. Why is this clear? It should be purple, right? So even if it's learned and it's not an automatic thing that happens, I think people still have a level of synesthesia in their brain. It's when one sense triggers a different sense so basically a smell reminds you of something visual something visual reminds you of something that you hear something that you hear reminds you of something that you see if everybody didn't have if our brains are naturally wired for it otherwise the score of a movie wouldn't mean shit why when you and it might be learned i've discussed this a lot with 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 people who are really into music why when you score a movie why is some music scary and why is some music happy the fuck does it have to do with anything the music isn't scary and it's not happy there's no such thing as happy music but you go okay so there's this learned thing of maybe birds and the wind in the trees and people laughing. These things have these certain tones and these certain notes and melodies naturally that they sound happy. And music that sounds like that is like that. And then when you hear a car crash or a gunshot or somebody screaming or whatever it is, then those things sound scary and our brain instantly knows. But the sounds in and of themselves, they don't really mean anything. So some of it could be learned, but at the same time, it seems like for the most part, it's kind of ingrained. Like there's things that our brain makes of other things. And there's a, there's a, there's the senses are go together. And when you do like hallucinogens, this barrier start to break down a little bit. And then you start to hear music and you listen to the music and it kind of makes your visuals change. And I think like that that's something that everybody's, um, that everybody's brain does, but maybe some people's brain do it in weird ways that make it a little more advantageous. You know what I mean? So that's, that's like a, that's a trippy thing. Cause I've just always looked at it and been like, well, it seems like it's gotta be in everybody's brain, but you know, not on the same degree. <clears throat> so describe please what you and i understand clearly what you're saying now so thank you for that explanation it's dope i i, I knew i was going to learn something if not various things tonight now uh so when it comes to sniffing weed you're saying exclusively this triggers what exactly in in you well for sure it triggers nostalgia so like i can smell something 
and I can get pictures in my head of a place I was, um, pictures of people, um, feelings of being in a particular place. And because you're pretty young when this happened, excuse me? What's that? You're pretty young. These memories take you back. Like this, this, these memories are probably aren't yeah, that fresh. I mean, even like if I smell someone burning sage, it'll like remind me of when I would smell weed when I was little. And I don't know if it's because people often were burning sage when they were smoking a joint because of the places that it is, because there's a big overlap with hippies burning shit. You know what I mean? But, um, it might also be that a lot of weed kind of had a little bit of that smell back then, or I don't know, but that's definitely a thing where that kind of like takes me back to being real little, or sometimes I'll smell someone light a joint. And it'll remind me, boom, of being a little kid or someone will light a cigarette. And it'll be like, boom. I remember when somebody lit a cigarette in the car or when way back in the day, you know, or whatever those things are, you smell an incense and it's like, that's the incense from that one place or, you know, whatever it is. And as far as I know, and what I've read, like the sense of smell, because it's really important for us, I think, to be able to evolutionarily, to be able to remember what a poison smelled like, remember what a medicine smelled like, remember what a food smelled like, remember what danger smelled like, you know what I mean? It's in our evolution for smells to take us back to memories, right? So for sure there's that, but there's also the other strange thing of going, this smell is like sharp. The smell like, the smell stings or this smell is dull or it's like, you know, I don't know. There's all these things that you smell when you smell. And, and if you're not thinking about it on a day-to-day -day basis, you might not know that your brain is even doing it. But when you're trying to figure out why things smell a certain way and why they strike you in a certain way, you start to realize that there's all these weird connections that go on. And um, so, you know, like there's just, I don't know, there, there's a, there's a trippy thing that happens with, um, with, um, you know, with the senses, with seeing things, with smelling things. And, uh, you know, they, they come in really handy with like dealing with any kind of breeding because you're able to, you're able to like, um, keep track of these different things, you know, but I, you know, I don't know really other than, other than that, like really precise things as far as the smells, but definitely like the nostalgia of smells is really big. And when you smell something, if somebody smells, that's why I like a lot of these old things. Somebody will smell something and they'll be like, whoa, that just took me back. I remember. And then they'll have a story to tell you. I remember when I smelled this and it's like, oh, that's fucking cool. Because there's these certain combinations in weed that people did smell 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. And they might've only smelled it once. And when they smell it again, it's like, boom, there it is, you know? So. But for you, I think there's a difference in that. <clears throat> I get the feeling like, uh, you know, we was definitely around in your childhood growing up. And, and I know you weren't probably too young when you start smoking it. How old were you start smoking it? I mean, I started Remind smoking me when I was really when you were nine years old. Little. I started smoking all the time when I was probably thirteen or fourteen. Probably like were you smoking at nine? 40. I mean, I smoked some. I smoked weed when I was nine, but I didn't smoke it. Like Did you smoke with Ted? Yeah, I Did you got, smoke with Ted? Got, when I was ten, I smoked probably several times. You know. Uh, but when I really actually you were, started, you're a wild child. Yeah. But I mean, Damn, you know, like, dude, I can't even picture you. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. So this is my point. Yeah. See, so this explains everything in my opinion. It's because, well, if I was, if I was like nine years old and I was already fascinated with weed or like, obviously you had something really intrigued you some something 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 you know 
and uh, freaking a man. It's like, it's been a beautiful relationship since the beginning, like this rich connection that you have, which again is definitive of your breeding and your style. And, and, it, and you're really expressing it to me verbally right now that the scent of the nose is so powerful that it's, you may not say it's your secret weapon, but it's definitely a developed sense that because I think you're soaked in this, in this multiverse from a young age. Um, yeah, dude, you, you're privy to so much. You, you, you must've, you've been around so much. That, that's the cool thing to me, you know? Yeah. I mean, so the mo so really like, I look at it like once I was like 14, I started really like learning about the subtleties of everything. Before that, I look at it like everything in my mind was just like some pot. And um, I think new smokers or inexperienced smokers, me personally, it was smoke and it was unpleasant. It didn't taste good. And I would a lot of times like didn't know, but if you cough while you're exhaling, you get harshed really bad. You won't enjoy it. You have to wait until you exhale all the smoke. If you're going to cough, you need to cough after the smoke is all the way out of your throat because when you cough while there's smoke coming out of your lungs, you are not going to think, oh, this is tasty. You're just going to be like, oh, I'm so harsh. And that's how it is when you don't know what's going on. And so for me, like, you know, everything really started for me when I had a peer group who was saying, oh, this is tasty. That's not tasty. And then you can see, and it's like, if you want to learn about like wine or whiskey or weed, or even, you know, a lot of foods to an extent, you have to have somebody who can say, taste this. What do you think of that? Now taste this. What do you think of that? And then go, okay, now I'm going to tell you that one is no good. And this one is really good. Taste it again. And then you try the one that they say is no good. And then you try the one that's really good and you go, well, what's better about the good one? And then they tell you, and then you try it again. And then over time, you start to go, oh, and your brain wakes up to these differences. And once you know, it's like you can't, you can't turn it off because now you know. But until you know, you just can't tell the difference. There's no, you don't have any frame of reference. There's no context to analyze the quality of things. So, um, there was a certain point when that clicked and after that point when i was probably about 14 <laughs> was when i started to be able to go okay this is this and this is this and this is this and then like you know we were so interested in it that it was always like you know you notice something and you're like hey check this out and then they notice something and then you're back and forth and you do this with the peer group and over time you know you come to have an understanding of how things are and um I think it's the same way with everything, you know, and uh, I think in in a vacuum as an island by yourself, you're never going to really understand what you would understand if you have people to bounce ideas against, you know. Um, but as far as like, it's like, oh, that huge advantage of from being way back, it's like, like I was saying earlier, a lot of it picks up later. Now, don't get me wrong to be started on that and be 14 and be in a neighborhood where everyone's growing plants from seed from lots of different varieties all this different stuff intermingled in all these poly hybrids and you can go oh there's this one and that one and that one and you name them all and you like go oh that's oh that's like that such and such this one's like that that one's like this and then you know it's definitely huge and i think the biggest advantage wasn't so much doing it from being young but from being in an era when everything, when every plant was an individual. And if someone had a plant, had a crop with 30 plants, they were all a little bit different and maybe they were all the way different. And, you know, a lot of people now who go learn, they might spend the whole year and all they learn about is gelato 41. They spend the next year and all they learn about is whatever it is like, Oh, it's years ago. Well, I, I learned for two years. I learned about gorilla glue. And then for three years, I learned about, you know, lemon cherry gelato that V and that now it's been three years I've been learning about. Yeah. Lemon cherry gelato. And so there's 
there's an advantage to that as well. Don't get me wrong. Cause those ones now you have one plan and you dial it in and you learn about that too. But, um, but I think it was really cool to learn about the subtleties of things in a time when there was, everything was different. And that's, what's so cool to see now is when people, you know, they're like, Oh, I have one of this and I have one of that and I have one of these and I popped it all from seed and here's how mine came out. And I, I love to see that because that's how I started and what made me really enthusiastic about stuff as opposed to like monocropping something that everyone already knows is good. It's like the little bit of the adventure and everything. And uh, when people come check out all the weird stuff I'm doing who are monocropping popular clones, they're like, oh, I'm reinvigorating. I'm in, I in, reinvigorated. I'm interested in plants again because look at this one and look at that one. And then they're like, I need to do a little thing off to the side just so I can look through brand new plants or a lot of different things that people have as clones or whatever, instead of just going a hundred percent all in producing this thing they know is the most efficient thing to produce. They're like, oh, okay, well, let me go ahead and take a little bit of my energy and do this hobby thing over here so I can still keep having fun because that's like, that was what made it fun for me had i started a different way i might have just been like dude i can get a job i'm just seeing the same thing again and again it becomes to me that style becomes like factory work because of my interests you know some people are more interested in the details of improving the one thing and i can appreciate <laughs> it too and if your mind works like that then that's what you run with you know there's different things for everybody but for me it was all about like you know uh exploring these different things and finding out about stuff. So that's where I've been stuck the whole time because I just like to see like, what's this going to be? What's that going to be? And, you know, the thrill of finding something cool and then something, you know, from the old days pops back out, you know? So like, it's all, um, you know, that's, that's the way that my brain works with all of it. So you're telling me that you live to, to be able to pop something from the past. Like, especially this Hindu Kush, it seems that you're really, you have a fervor. Why, why the Hindu? Is it, it's the nose? Was it the effect? Was it an experience? It's the effect. It's the way it smokes. It's the fact that it is like the original, the original Kush clone before we knew about all these Kushes everyone else talked about. This Kush was here when people talk about, Oh, OG, People are saying like, oh, maybe they saw it as far back as 92 or whenever back then. Ted's talking about he saw this in 88. When people are talking about Bubba Kush, they're like, yeah, was this really this crazy? There was the Bubba and that was a totally pure Indica. Like that was in the 90s. Like I'm talking about this is in the 80s. This is that type of weed, like a Bubba Kush or a Master Kush from before all that. So that clone is 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 less bottlenecked it's um not crossed with any og it's not hybridized with anything it um has the killer effect where it's like real kind of overall potent so it has some head high to it but it has a really heavy body high to it like i don't really want to smoke it in the day that much but you can get away with it because it's not totally dull but it is heavy. Um, it's, it's potent weed. And it is to me like that really nostalgic um, kind of coffee smelling with a little bit of like underlying Afghani acrid funk to it. Like not like skunk skunk, but like that little bit of, you know, like, I mean, it, I won't say that it's in the realm of like the gassy stuff. It's not really super loud smelling. If you have lots of other weed around it and you smell it, you won't smell it that much. But if you light up a joint of that around people who know what that is in the air, people will go, damn, you know, is that Hindu? Because it's that thing, you know, and, it, and it's basically like not very different than Master or Bubba but it's older, you know, it's like this, um, super cool one. So it was just, for me, it was like one that I bred, I did stuff with it. And I, 
I never kept it as a clone because everybody had it. And I would just, Hey, can I get a clone? And I bred it. And then I started doing seed work with it. And then by the time I was like, I should do more with that. I asked everybody and they're like, no, we don't have it anymore. And it was gone. And it took me from having it and breeding it maybe in 2005 to getting it back um, year before last year before this, it's still this year. So I got it last year. Um, but what was, what did you get last year that, excuse me, a clone or seeds? The clone. It's the, it's the original, it's the original clone from the eighties. It's the real, what? The real yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my question yeah. Jackson is this, is me as my limited experience as a grower <clears throat> in order to keep the genetic integrity of, in this case, uh, this Kush, you know what I'm saying? The Hindu Kush. How long can you keep a mom until you got to like grow the clones up? You know, you can't, it's not, it's not the same mom since the eighties, right? No, I mean, you know, you can keep a plant generations. You can keep a plant as long, like a single mom, as long as you can keep that plant healthy. So like, say you were really goofy and you had a barn, you could take one plant and string up lights everywhere on all sides of it and continue to move them out and move them up as it got really big. And you could keep cutting it back and growing it out and cutting it back and growing it out. And I'm sure you could keep mom, one, one mom of a plant. You could keep it for years and years and years. Um, but because of the way things work, like when your plant becomes unhappy in the size pot that it's in and then you start giving it more food to keep it happy, to keep it happy. Eventually that pot is not where it wants to live anymore. And at that point you have to either transplant it to a bigger pot or you have to clone it. And so me, I don't clone things super often because I don't need to, but I usually clone everything a couple times a year. And um, I'm sure that the Hindu has been cloned a lot of times you know um since i've had it let me see my what i have now that's my stock i cloned it i've probably only cloned it like three times since i got it you know as far as to make new moms and that's over the course well, i'm not of questioning the integrity I'm, I'm i'm no excuse me uh no i, I understand you you've bred it three times or you've cloned it three times since you've had it you're saying yeah 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 y that's that's cool man uh i'm saying is that as a breeder as somebody who's holding stock it's that fine balance of how long do you hold on to that mom for until you take those cuts because if you're really holding various genetics it's a, it's a task right to be taking cuts on a frequent basis i would imagine i one would want to like extend that as much as possible without uh degenerating you know compromising the genetic quality so you can imagine, though, that if this clone is from 1988, if that was going to happen, it would have already gone to shit in the 90s. Like, there's no way that the reason this clone is still a fire ass Hindu cut from the 80s, it's not because people didn't make lots of copies. It's been copied and copied and copied and copied and copied. And, copied and for luckily, it's never picked up any disease because it's been held by certain people along the way there's probably there's probably offshoots where it went over here and it got diseased it went over there and it got diseased it went over here it died of this it died of that and then there's this one boom, 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 going through clone to clone to clone to clone to where when i got it it's a really vigorous clone so for me in my experience i'm not worried about degrading through cloning it too often I honestly think that you're probably more likely to degrade it by not cloning it often enough, if that makes sense. Meaning that as the mom gets old and loses vigor and you clone from it, you can slowly lose momentum and lose momentum and lose momentum. And now if you take one of those that's like, you're like, this clone is tired. It's not that good anymore. If you can get it really, really healthy again and clone it and then take a clone off a really healthy one and take a clone off a really healthy one, all of a sudden it'll be super healthy again. But it's gonna be cloning it often that's gonna help you to get there as opposed to avoiding cloning it often. I think avoiding cloning it often probably would hurt it more. But even though I don't clone them that often, they seem to still just be fine. You just have to make your plant be really healthy 
And the clones that come off it at any stage when it's really healthy, they'll just kick ass. You'll have great, great clones. It's a trip, you know, it's a very resilient plant. And although things can genetically change along the way, as long as you take your clone off the one that's the most normal, then you're going to keep on having the one that's the most normal. You definitely don't want to clone one when it looks like it freaked out and now it's different. What the hell's going on with this one? Like, no, pick the one, choose the mom that's the one that looks normal just in case it gets stuck like that because things do um, genetically change even if they've never been bred. That that does happen. You get mutations in sports and um, and things that, that, that freak out, you know? No, and I was simply, uh, you know, observing how much of a miracle almost it is to be able to have that uh, strain, the Hindu Kush. Now it's in your hands all these years later, later, decades later, and you're you're obviously happy with it. So to me, that means that it's checking all the boxes to what you remembered decades ago. Yeah, that's what's trippy, you know, as I was able to like grow some and run it out. And, you know, I, of course, reversed some. I seeded some with some various things. And then I left some to um, be another wave of flower. And the flowers, like, uh, you know, everybody who smoked it was like, wow, that's really, that's killer Hindu. Like, it's still really, really good. And, um, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, just uh, like a, uh, testament to to the the resilience of the way that a plant can be you know clones are a trip dude like you would think like oh it's gonna be it's probably not gonna be the same as it used to be but it's you know it's just as good as any i ever grew super cool yeah so i have to know the story behind the hindu kush did it come out of la did somebody travel overseas and go right into mendo and, and pop it so Hindu Kush is a funny, um, a funny name because it's a region. So it's like saying, oh, I have Thai, I have Mexican, I have Colombian. Like, well, if you're really getting into it, you're like, well, which one do you have? Which Hindu Kush do you have? So in my opinion, this is likely to have come out of seeds that were sold as a seed pack that were labeled Hindu Kush as something that people were selling as seeds. And I only know of two like that. There's the Sacred Seeds Hindu Kush, which was an early 80s California seed um, from Sacred Seeds, the, the company. And you can find, if you Google, you can find Hindu Kush, you know. And then if you look at, um, if you look at Neville's work, uh, Neville, as far as I remember, I don't think I invented it, also has a Hindu Kush. And his Hindu Kush, I think he said was Kush 4, cross Northern Lights 2 or something like that. Um, or Kush 4, Northern Lights 1, I can't remember, but something like that. And essentially just a really good Afghani. But for a clone to have traveled with the name Hindu Kush attached to it in the time period that it's from, I think that it would have probably come from one of those. Because otherwise, various things from the Hindu Kush region, they travel with the name of the specific um, area of origin, right? So like somebody will have something, you know, the Hindu Kush region, if you go ahead and look it up on a, on a globe, on a map, you'll see like, oh, it's this big area. And among those places are a lot of areas that you will have heard about with um weed like with a, a name attached to a particular type of seeds um you know you'll have these 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 other names so hindu kush is a very broad term and not something that i would normally think people would call any type of weed unless it was one of these couple people who a kind of kind of gave it a goofy name like you know not a lot of well, neville predates I'm sorry. I was just going to say not a lot of things get released named for a region. There's not a lot of Thai. There's chocolate Thai. There's lemon Thai. There's such and such Thai. There's peanut Thai. There's these names from Thailand. There's the names that in Thailand that they attach to the thing. There's Colombian. Sure. Colombian is an import. 
but typically um, something that came from that region would have would have arrived and it would have been called Afghani, it would have been called Pakistani, it would have been called Khyber, it would have been called any of the things that are in this whole big area, um, they, they, those names would have been attached to the seeds. So Hindu Kush, in my opinion, was a strange thing anyway to call something because it's vague. It's like these seeds, oh, what, what seeds are these? Oh, these are Colombian. But when you ask people what Colombian is, they're like, oh, this is, this is um, you know, whatever these various uh, Colombians are. They'll usually give you a region or something that they called it in the place, you know? So, you know, you have the Central American stuff. It usually comes, there's very few people who have seeds that are labeled Mexican, although they exist usually they are Oaxacan or they're, you know, Limon Verde or they're whatever the different things are. They usually have a name or a region attached. So when I see this clone from the 80s labeled as Hindu Kush, it leads me to believe that it came from one of these two seed companies that gave these goofy seed lines the name Hindu Kush, you know. Um, and it, is that 100% true? I have no idea. That's my instinct, though, based on, on um, you know, like the way things normally work. So that's what I think the origin of it probably was. It's one, it's like some of the other things, if I really dug around, like if I talked to my friend Justin, who was the one who I knew who originally had it, um, then he might be able to say, I got it from this guy named Jamie. And, and then you go like, well, is he still around? Oh yeah, he is. I never bothered to ask him anything about it. It's just killer dope. You might ask him and be like, dude, can I talk to him? Like, oh yeah, sure. He don't care. You know? And then you might find out. I might eventually find out what the origin was of it. There was one story that I heard from here, um, from a friend of mine, who's an older lady who used to grow indoor long before most people. She was up on Spy Rocker and her husband. And she said that she re remembered the first Hindu from right around the mid eighties sometime. And then it was popped here by a guy who did a lot of heroin named Frank. And that he was the first guy who had it. And that that was where she remembered it spreading out from and that he was the guy who it came from. But when I talked to my buddy, Justin, he's like, oh, no, I got it from so and so. And it didn't the stories didn't line up. So is her story not right? Doesn't mean anything that it's not. But it doesn't, you know, it's it could be from Leggett. It could be from Garberville. It could be from Seattle. It could be from it could be from fucking, you know, the Appalachian Mountains. There's no telling exactly where it's from, but um, but I, I believe it to have come out of that, the one of those original um, either Seed Bank or Sacred Seed releases, just because the name is, is vague and an interesting way to label seeds that come from places that sound more exotic in a lot of cases, I think. Like, I thought those are kind of weird way to name things, you know, so. No, no, no. You make a great point. <clears throat> and so in my mind, I'm thinking, does Neville predate sacred seeds? No, no. Neville's later. So sacred Neville's seeds, later. as I understand it, is like 83 or 82 or somewhere in there. And that could be wrong. Um, there's a timeline of seed banks in one of the Canna Bibles in the beginning. And I never saw it for a while after I had it. And then we found it one time. We're like, Whoa, this is interesting. I've never heard of this. I've never heard of that. And in there, they talk about the releases that Sacred Seeds did. That's where Skunk One came from. That's uh, where a Hindu Kush release came from, you know. And then all the Amsterdam stuff is weird. I would never be surprised to find out that Neville made more of the Hindu Kush from Sacred Seeds and said he used his own parents from it that were harder for other people to get so that other people wouldn't just make more of the same seeds and sell them themselves because that was a big issue in Amsterdam. I feel like it wouldn't be crazy to imagine that some of them tried to mislead people a little bit to throw them off the trail of what these things were that they had that were valuable. Um, and that's not to say that that it, it's like, you know, he was dishonest and that's why he did it. Or it's just like, if it happened, it wouldn't be like the hugest shocker in the world. Um, 
but as far as what is on paper and what he said, and you know, I, I, I trust it. He said that it was, his was different, but like I said, interesting to have, you know, uh, two things called Hindu Kush. And it was just because there's this Hindu Kush type. If you look in the can of, uh, not the can of Bible, I'm sorry. If you look in marijuana botany, um, there's pictures this is congolese this is colombian this is mexican this is hindu kush and when you look at the hindu kush picture in there that was um drawn by rob clark you'll see like oh okay that's like a nice big afghani beautiful type it's pretty similar to like what the hindu kush is so it was understood as far back then. I think he wrote that right in the very end of the 70s. And he already had a picture he had drawn of what he considered to be Hindu Kush. And it's very much the Afghani that we think of um, when we think of a pure Afghani now, like with the big central, the main, the big, big leaves that get 11 to 15 fingers and all that this particular clone doesn't get a lot of fingers but it is very very much a pure afghani and um you know it's super cool and it is similar to some things that seem to be northern lights based um so you know neville's neville's stock would make sense as well as it being some kind of a northern lights thing and i haven't specifically seen um anything that could be directly tied to sacred seeds hindu kush to say whether that's the same although it would be fairly likely that clark's drawing would be something that maybe could be there since it's the circles were small back then i would imagine uh, yeah no no, no. Oh, excuse me 100 percent. not only that but uh what was i gonna say uh it's well known that in amsterdam at the time uh these guys are relying on American genetics to do their thing. Is that correct? Say it again. That at, at that time, the American. Oh, back then. No, yeah, back then that the Dutch guys are relying on American genetics to do their thing out in Amsterdam. I mean, it, you know, that's what's funny about. It. There's always like a big argument over the East Coast, the West Coast. No, it's all Amsterdam. Like, dude, people can really say what they want, but if you trace everything back, a lot of it goes back to like Santa Cruz, Humboldt. Mendocino. If you ask, people are like, oh, well, I got this well, chem dogs from the East Coast. Like, is it? Ask them. They said they got it from the West Coast. You know, OG is OG is this. The best stories we can find of what the origins of OG are, they sound like it was made from stuff out here. You know, New York's like, well, we have the haze. Miami, we have the haze. Yeah, well, you know, Hayes is, 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 you know, it's Colombian. And the first place where the name and the term came out was in California in the 60s. You know, nobody's like, oh, I was in New York and I had the haze in the 60s. They didn't, it's just not how it is. And that's not to give credit to like, oh, it's this region. It's just, the fact is that this was where it was remote. So there's a lot of places that were really remote that really have a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff came out of Ohio. I'm sure there's probably still people who are in Montana who have been indoor in bunkers and shit you never heard about. People grow a shitload of weed in Maine, Vermont, um, you know, Virginia. There is a lot of stuff everywhere, all over, wherever it's remote. But most of the stuff doesn't originate in big cities. It's just not where weed goes. It's not where it came from the indoors didn't take off till later this stuff all happened in the 60s and 70s you know no, no, but i think you said it you said grown in a bunker <clears throat> in a bunker i can't really communicate in san jose grown indoor is you're not really communicating with nobody it's just the nature of the game but in humble even at the height of the war on drugs the whole freaking community is like designed you know to fucking counteract this shit which is um, so cool in my opinion you know yeah there was you know there was a whole thing going ah! has nothing Excuse to do me. like it's that's the fun that's the funniest thing you know like it's like um you know it, you might as well argue about like east coast versus west coast rap like what is this is this fucking death row and fucking bad boy like the whole thing is ridiculousness you know like you look at it and you go well tupac's from the east coast fucking you know like there's old you know hip-hop was originated by cool herker was from jamaica you know, Hayes is Colombian. 
fucking the weed that was here that made the cushions it comes from afghanistan no one ever wants to go man fuck the west coast afghanistan's where the real shit's from and that's the truth you know the west coast ain't shit without afghanistan pakistan thailand colombia and then all that stuff really all originates you know like and when you really study history you realize that all these little arguments they're shallow and they don't really look at history because it's all, those are all details, East Coast and West Coast. Weed ain't from here. It doesn't come from California. It doesn't come from Oregon. It doesn't come from New York. You know, it comes from Northern India, Southern China, somewhere over there. Been in Africa forever. Been in all these places, you know? Like, if you want to really, like, look, if you really want to go East Coast, West Coast, you're like fucking Silk Roads, motherfucker. Like, that's where this is really from, you know? Like, everything comes off of the old trade routes that were coming out of, you know, that are from Eurasia. When basically Europe and Asia, as it really is, was considered one place and everything all weed comes from eurasia and africa it's all one big connected place and it ain't very well connected to fucking the west coast and the east coast of the united states we're all new like everybody here has had this for a little bit of time and over there everybody's had it for thousands and thousands of years you know so <laughs> you know um some of amsterdam what they originally fed off was from africa thailand india china korea even you know places all over the place but as far as what really got sold in the 80s by the seed banks by when neville really set it off and did all that he had to get everything from from the u.s you know and uh and uh people you know here did feed him the the genetics to be able to make that stuff happen and then ironically once ever because they have the the machine for people to find out about it like you said, yeah, there was people here communicating, but it was still pretty underground, but everybody could get high times, right? And so people would get their hands on high times and go, whoa, who's this? Oh, these seeds, these sound really good. And everybody here didn't even realize they were just buying back their own shit, watered down and fucked up in a lot of cases. And they would have been better off going up the road and asking so-and-so, hey, I don't want to be weird, but like, I'll bet you got some cool seats, huh? And if they would have got that, they would have had the things that Neville wished he could got his hands on. But everybody went and ran over to Amsterdam and bought all that shit and started growing that. And then they had names that were recognizable. And then they stopped making their own seats here. They lost a lot of stuff here without even realizing that if they would have taken it over to Amsterdam, Neville might have thrown away some of this stuff to get his hands on what they already had but when it doesn't have a name and you go to tell people what it is they're like i don't know i'm not interested in it they have to grow it to know how good it is or see the weed and people a lot of times like i said back in the day they didn't have weed in their hands very long so you're not always walking around with weed it's like hey it's november 15th and everybody's shit is gone because there's not that many producers back then so the whole paradigm was completely uh different but um you know, it, it really was. I mean, Neville, if you look at the history, you go, yeah, he went to, you know, he brought back hash plant. He brought back Northern Lights or was given, I don't know if he was sent or what, but he got Northern Lights. He got Haze. If you look at a lot of, a lot of Neville's work, it's based on a few things, you know, some Afghani, some Haze, some Northern Lights, which was Afghani or Afghani hybrid. Um, you look through everything and you go, oh, there's not that many things. And they, they, they pretty much were all from the West Coast, you know. Skunk Man Sam brought over Skunk One um, and Hayes, and he got those on the West Coast. And those things are still, you know, they kind of dominated. But they weren't ever probably better than the very best. But like I said, everybody kind of got hoodwinked and wound up buying back all this stuff that was brought from here and then probably you know i watched it happen i watched a lot of people lose stuff people start growing ak-47 and their family used to have seeds but this one performs really well it does good inside and then they don't make seed and then they're like you know what i should pop my seeds and they're like damn they don't come up anymore and i watched it i mean i've talked to so many people when i went to track down different old stuff that I was like, you know what, that was really good back in the day. And I'm like, you guys still got that? And they'll do that was 20 years ago. And I'm like, yeah, but you didn't. They're like, no, we tossed it. We started growing OG. Like, All right. 
it was fire you know but <laughs> it didn't it wasn't called og it didn't have the price you know so no that yeah dude <clears throat> that's why i give so much credit to guys that and gals i'm sure that i have been holding genetics over time it's not an easy thing dude yeah in one in one regard it's not easy to keep like everything but in the case of a lot of these people they only had one kind of seed and all they really needed to do was just put a little pollen on some females of what they had and they would have had it and it wouldn't have really been much work and then when you went and talked to so-and-so up in Bell Springs, they'd be like, yeah, we, we still have some. And, and I have a couple friends who are a little bit more sustainable that are more of farmers and like value seed in general more. And you ask them and you're like, do you still have your cool old shit from the 90s? And they're like, yeah, we got it. It's all in the fridge. We make it fresh sometimes. And those people, I don't even, I don't even, I don't ask them for seed because I don't need to make any because I already know that they make it. But when I talk to somebody and they're like, yeah, I have seed in the fridge and I don't know what I'm ever going to do with it. And I'm like, it, that was good. And they're like, yeah, I don't know, whatever, dude, you want it. I'm like, yeah, give it to me because you obviously are going to lose it. And then it's going to be gone. And then there's no benefit to that at all. You know? So it's like things that I know people really are going to enthusiastically keep. I don't even want anything to do with it because I know somebody's got that covered. But I do want always want to get the things that like people seem like they're just going to abandon. And I'm like, but it's those are good plants and they might not even be good. Like, sure, maybe you can't sell the weed, but it doesn't mean that they're not cool or they don't have a valuable couple traits in them that are important for us to be able to incorporate or might have some resistance to something like septoria or some kind of weird bug that gets introduced like a moth and we don't know it's there because it hasn't got here yet from south korea or wherever it gets imported on a shipment of fucking who knows what you know like you you need all the different genetics so like you know you, you gotta you gotta have uh you gotta have stuff but it's a trip because I lost a lot of things thinking it would be complicated to keep things and then look back and go, dude, it would have been so easy to just have a couple of plants and some six inch pots and make a couple hundred more seeds and put them in the fridge or take the seeds that I already made pure, put them in the fucking fridge. Don't leave them in the closet because I had some shit that went bad sitting in the closet too. And like you, you can never, you know, you never stop kicking yourself for that because you're like, dude, it was bomb and now it don't pop, you know? So um, kind of a little bit of knowledge and also understanding that things are important is big. So, you know, I always want to tell people like, hey, if it's if it's not the same as everything else, it's important. It doesn't matter if it's not as good or if it's different or it doesn't fit in or whatever it is. Like, no, the shit's important because it's not what everything else is. You know, you might discover, yeah, it's totally no stone. Oh, guess what? CBD is a thing. You guys didn't fucking know that until 2014 and everybody threw away all their shit because it didn't get you high. And then they found out, oh, damn, CBD. You realize like, yeah, you guys might have thrown away 33% CBD strains, you know, but it didn't get you high. So who wants it? You know, now it's valuable. And you're like, because right. I almost did it with some stuff. Just didn't get you high, you know. That That's so interesting, man. <clears throat> uh it's all it's all such a dope conversation now before i forget this question how long do you think even if it's in the fridge uh a, a seed can last uh until it's not viable anymore if you get your seeds nice and dry and you put them away with something that will suck up the extra little bit of moisture that might have been in there when you packed them and you make sure it's truly airtight and you keep them cold. Um, I personally believe, and I'm not old enough to say it 100%, but I personally believe you could put away your seeds, pull them out in 30 years, and they'd all be fine. Because I pull out things from 10 years ago, and they're 100% like the day I put them in the fridge. 10 years. Wow. You know? And, uh, and now... Um, had I put things away, they would be fine. I mean, I know 
Tom Hill recently pulled out Hayes to Sprout, and I think he popped, I can't, I can't remember, a few hundred, and he got, I don't know, half of them came up or something. But he had put those away. I think they were labeled like 96 or something like that. And he put them in like an ammo box buried in the ground. It's like 50 degrees. So imagine if they're frozen. They last longer. The oldest seeds that anybody has been ever to bring back from being, you know, frozen, I think is 28,000 years. Not weed seeds, but a seed. It's a seed from a plant pulled out of the permafrost from like a squirrel den in fucking wherever it was. I can't remember where it was. It was like Northern Canada or Siberia or some shit. And they found a little place where some little animal like had put away like little seeds and they found it and they took them and they're all, huh, they've been frozen. I wonder what's the deal. And they basically like, you know, took them and put them in a lab. I don't think they even tissue cultured them, but I can't remember. They might, because see with tissue culture, if you do it right, you only need some live cells. You can multiply them and you, you can turn them into plants. But I'm pretty sure that in this case, they sprouted them. I think they might have like done embryo rescue, but I could be wrong. But it doesn't matter because imagine just live the way technology is now, if you have some live cells in there, you know, it's there. Like these seeds I'm talking about that I didn't put away and they're no good, they might come back. You know, they might return if they if 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 there's live cells. And there appears to be live cells because they sprout a little. They just don't grow, you know. Um, they ain't 28,000 years old, you know. They were, what, I don't know. 12 years old or something when I put them in the fridge and I didn't put them in the fridge because I had planted them up until 10 years old out of the closet and they were still 100%. And then I started keeping my house a little warmer. They don't come up anymore, you know? So cold storage is huge. Just if your house is cold, they last longer, you know? And, you know, when it comes to land race, you know, and, and, Taking it and thank you for that, by the way. You know, absolutely. I was just really curious because, you know, I, I'd never heard heard a, a definitive answer really. But, you know, I, I remember having a conversation with you when you were saying how, as a breeder, you can only do so much in your career. You know, you can only focus on so many things, go in so many directions. So why not really focus on, you know, x amount of directions and and see them through, so to speak. Uh, and so with land race. It's a lot of work, dude. It's a lot of work, I think, to go through land race. Now, uh, I don't want to make it seem like it's this daunting thing, but um, how do you feel about not necessarily you and your shoes and the position you're in right now, but somebody to undertake that with really wanting to shake things up? Well, the interesting thing about land race is that I don't think there's very many populations even all throughout history i think that in the current form that we know like imagine like corn all forms of corn now even if you can find them growing wild which i'm sure you can in certain regions of the world they're all made by people so there's not like land race corn the equivalent of a land race corn isn't corn it's a grass. Um, and I think that basically with weed, there are still some wild populations, but I'm tempted to believe that all wild populations of cannabis are more likely some level of feral, meaning that they escaped from people after people did things to them. And so <laughs> when people talk about land Think of them as being really, really uh, like, um, there's two general generalizations I see with land race. Either land race is a pure line and it only is one way, or land race is a lot of garbage with a little bit of stuff in it if you really want to do a lot of work to find some stuff. And I think that both of those are true and that you have to know what you're actually talking about. 
I think with a certain amount of like, like I grew some freshly imported Mazar seeds and they were just like seeds I would have got from someone here who said that they had worked on them for years and years. And why is that? Because they came from some dude in Afghanistan who was probably better at breeding the seeds he had than most people are in California or wherever other place, Amsterdam, where you want to name it. Like people look at it like, oh, this Afghanistan, like, you know, like you think this is like these, these people are like primitive minded, like because they're in this other place, like, no, hate to tell you, but these guys like are sharp and they know what a fat juicy bud full of crazy fucking resin with a great flavor and a great high looks like like you think that they don't know that and so they just have a bunch of loose bullshit that doesn't grow any good weed it's like no they they've been working on it forever for so much longer than anybody else and so there's some things that you get that are going to be quote unquote land races that are actually from the place where they originated, but they're somebody's seeds. They're not just wild reefer, right? And then there's other stuff that you might get your hands on where you're going to plant it and you're going to go, whoa, even outdoor 90, 90% of them are all intersex and they hardly get any usable weed and they take forever to flower. And then when you smoke them, they taste really harsh and bad. And like, yeah, that's going to exist too. But you're going to have a whole range in between all of those things. And depending on which region you're coming from, some of these things that we're calling land races are actually heirlooms from people who have put a lot of care into making the things that they make. And so... Um, in reality, what we're calling land race in a lot of cases is really just another person's or group of people's seeds that they've done a lot of work on to make very special and in incorporating land race into things or adopting them as pure lines, you're actually getting something as if it came from me or getting something as if it came from you know, somebody who does really advanced work on things that like is more than I've done. Like the, these are people who are growing fields of thousands and thousands and oftentimes pulling the seeds out as they make hash from the plants. So they're not just walking around in a field and going, huh, I wonder what these things are. They're actually taking the plants and going through them going, this one looks really good and checking it out and going, yeah, wow, that's a lot of hash. This is try that. Oh, this is really good. hash. All right. Keep this handful of seed, put this by the house. We're going to go ahead and take this, make seed. And then in a year or two, we'll go ahead and plant the whole field out of this seed. And people take that for granted thinking that these people are just crazy foreigners that don't know anything about weed like california people you know and it's like yeah no these uh, a lot of the stuff that showed up when it showed up was already really really killer weed you know because you heard the timeline I, i'm i'm talking about right we're saying that indica was very reasonably unknown in the united states before the 80s and then you have a group of people who are releasing killer weed by at the latest 1985 imagine that imagine that i made that i made you know stuff that people know imagine that i bred root beer in 2008 2007 right so now we're in 2023 and like i'm still working on doing stuff with it People are just finding out about it. I'm giving people the seeds. And we're thinking that in a time when everybody was growing outdoor weed, that the difference between 1980, when the indica first arrived in California, and 1985, 
we completely flipped the paradigm of what this weed is and turned it from garbage land race into what I have now that I'm still like, oh, this clone, Hindu Kush, I'm putting it on everything. Between 80 and, and 88 at the latest, eight years of outdoor breedings. So who were the master breeders who were able to accomplish that when they hadn't even seen Indica until 1980? And in eight really, years, Jackson, excuse me, you're saying that Indica didn't hit the scene? Or what kind of weed were people smoking? Purely sativa in the hippie days? For the 70s? most part, Oaxacan was one of the really big ones here because it was more of a, of a easy to manage thing. Now, of course, there's people who say that they had Afghani as far back as the late 60s. And although some of the stories are super dubious, I believe it because I know for a fact that the hog farm hippies all went to Afghanistan in like 1967 or 69, way back when, and they got a really warm welcome. And you can't tell me that they weren't already smoking weed and dropping acid and that they would have overlooked the fact that there was really, really phenomenal hashish in Afghanistan and not wondered about, hmm, I wonder if we could grow this stuff back home, you know? So they, the, the way that things were back then, nobody would have been like, hey, I got the seeds. Nobody's going to say shit. They're not going to write it down. They're not going to take a picture. They don't want to fucking go life in prison for some fucking, for some Afghani. So the, the, the earliest re recorded real verifiable claims of Indica, meaning Pakistani or Afghani reaching like this area um, is like 78. But I know for a fact that stuff that's in my stuff didn't arrive until like 84. So that's when like the big, the bit like the Mazar really like went around was like in 83, 84, 85. So my point just being that that eight years or let's call it 10 years, let's call it 10 years between 78 and 88 when we can verify the first definite arrival and 88. 78 to 88 when we know that hindu was at least here since 88 even though you're acknowledging that in the, excuse me in 69 hogwash went out there the hog farm so hog farm. I'm, I'm i'm saying that yes it could have been there but what i'm also saying is that i know for a fact that stuff that's in my stuff that i got my hands on in 93 94 right that had already been killer since it arrived. And I know because the people who got the seeds from the dude who brought the seeds back from Afghanistan, the seeds were the shit when they arrived in 84, 85. But I'm saying even with something like the Hindu, it's unlikely that it arrived before 78. And the weed that I'm still saying is really killer and I'm excited about it in 2023, we know it was already at that stage in 88. And as a breeder, breeding a lot of stuff outdoor in a lot of cases over my breeding career, I find it hard to believe that the weed went from being some shitty land race in 78 to the Hindu clone I have in 88. I don't, I don't buy it. I think that when it arrived in 78, people were like, damn, this is some fire. Make some seeds. And then it probably got made a few times and somebody started selling seeds of it. And it was just like what we got right now. And I've said that before because it's my, you know, I really, I really believe that. I don't think that, um, you know, that there, that you can't, you couldn't have got like really high grade weed and, you know, yeah. Was it lemon cherry gelato? Was it animal cookies? Was it OG Kush? Well, probably not all of it, but I'll bet if you grow a fucking thousand females of the original imports of Afghani, there was one or two that you would go, yeah, because because I know that through hybridization, you can get things to pop out that are better than what went into them just because of hybridization and hybrid vigor and, um, you know, other little things that happen when genetics combine. But um, for the most part, I think the things that are really valuable that we want, which is like extreme potency or extreme flavor, I think usually the cases that they exist and it's just a matter of finding them and getting them to be a little bit more frequent and show up more often in a population as opposed to thinking that they appear out of thin air through the magic of improvement and breeding i think that in most cases it's like they 
they're there. And I mean, some stuff a lot, I mean, I've, I've had for myself, I've had really special things happen from combining things. So I know that there could have been a lot of improvements, but I also know that, yeah, like black lime is really cool to me because it has the liminess from one side and the real good smokable potency from the other side. But the potency was definitely already there on the one side. I didn't invent that. It just carried over and was there. And anybody who breeds a lot too knows that potency, you usually don't pull it out of thin air. You pull it from one of the parents. So like if you want to use, you, you use OG and you make things, you boost the potency. It's like with hot peppers, you use a hot pepper and boost the heat. You don't just automatic, it doesn't just show up out of nowhere. You have to usually find somewhere to pull it from. And so um, I think like with now with people using all these things, like, like you, the stuff you got your hands on direct from Pakistan, direct from Afghanistan. I think when people grow these things, you grow 10 of them, you might go, yeah, whatever. It's kind of loose. It's not that great, whatever. But I think if you grow a thousand of them, you might find that one plant that is the parent that's carrying unique um, potency or unique terps or whatever it is, you know? And um, so I think some of them, it's going to be like a crazy odyssey to turn it into anything good at all because it's just not that great. But I think that there's other ones where it's like, no, it's, we're calling it a land race, but don't, don't, can, don't think that it's going to be like some loose ass weird bush sativa that is all shit because these people have been trying to get big yields of hashish for thousands of years and this is what they got and they're not just gonna you know think that it's good when they're not they're growing the whole field and they're not getting any hash you know or it's just smoking like shit like there's there's got to be real valuable traits to to adopt out of those you know but ultimately, you're saying like the Hindu Kush is an example. Sacred Seeds did the work. Are they NorCal, SoCal based? Do you know? I believe they were in SoCal somewhere. I'm Big not really very well versed on the history of all that kind of stuff. And I also noticed that when you try to dig into history of everything, it all comes down to one, somebody's word on it. And this is how it was. And then there's always someone else who says, no, it wasn't like that. And so it's a lot of like back and forth, like, oh, you want to know what the original story is of the sour diesel? Cool. But if you find all the people who agree that they were the first people there, they don't even agree. You know what I mean? Even if you ask like me and my friends about some stuff, we might be sitting in a room and one dude will be like, no, I remember it like this. And you're like, bro. Are you serious? It's the, you remember this? And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you don't have people to sit there and they're not all there to actually interact and correct each other and try to get back to the what the common truth is of everything, like all the old stories, they're really um, kind of all over the place and hard to figure out. So I like it's like all neat. But at the same time, I'm like, all right. But as far as like where was the the area that sacred seeds was i don't know i mean i wouldn't be surprised if it was based somewhere out of around santa cruz um that was like a place where stuff was really going on a lot of people moved here from santa cruz my parents moved here from santa cruz my buddy's parents moved here from santa cruz they were tied in with you know brotherhood of eternal love and all that old stuff and like uh like bands like there was like a whole bunch of bands that were down there and there was this place i can't remember what it was called chateau something and if you if you look into it there's like a real deep history there of all that stuff and a lot of people who moved up here they were part of that kind of like commune type area where everybody was you know into all that kind of stuff and um i wouldn't be surprised if they were tied in with that as well. Um, they might've been unrelated, but that was like a, one of those real central um, hubs of a lot of stuff that happened, you know, with all the people who were, you know, um, making acid and, you know, different, you know, bikers and all the different stuff. Cause there was, you know, the, the outlaw counterculture kind of had to stay in these little pockets 
and uh, Santa Cruz was one of the major ones. And you talk to people, and like I said, you know, like there's there's like a little place like that, like in Tennessee. There's a place like that in Virginia. Um, there's different places where there's these little pockets of uh, of people. But um, yeah, and I'm not exactly sure where uh, where they were out of down there. But you know, I always kind of think of that as being where everything was, but. That might just be because of all the other stories, you know? Well, I keep on going back and forth because, I mean, um, I took, I, I missed a step. So I'm saying we're talking about land race and how, again, from 78 to 88, I agree. I, I agree absolutely. And given my personal experience in Pakistan, you know, the culture is to welcome your guest as if they're your, your long lost brother like your twin brother, older brother, or just, you know, something like your father or something. I mean, yeah. I mean, not, maybe that's not the best example, but like a kindred, like a kindred family member. And yeah, yeah. I would assume that as, you know, to validate what you're saying, <clears throat> they were given the best, you know, when they visited Afghanistan, whoever came through and did the damn thing. It's the best of the read, the best. They, they would scout out. If it wasn't like, it didn't have to be your contact there where, where you're staying, they, they'd go travel, you know, by horse and, I don't think there's telephones back then and shit like that, but you know, make sure you got the dank seed for sure. So it's beautiful. I, and so again, you're tracking this by a decade, 70 to 88. So you bring this up because really, um, it ha it hasn't gone through so many hands as we think it has. It hasn't seen as much genetic fluctuation as we think it has. Is that, is that the point? Yeah. The point is that when I hear people talk about it is those two extremes, you know, people are like, Oh, land race is all bullshit. Good luck with that. It ain't what you think it's going to be. It ain't fun. You're not going to find nothing. It's not worth it. Just go ahead and get the cuts that you know about and hit them and get some good seeds from somebody. And then, you know, the other end of it is thinking that land race is naturally like perfect parent stock because it's 100% consistent. Thai weed is Thai weed, Afghani weed is Afghani weed. And what I'm saying is that you have to know which one of those it is because in some cases, both could be true. And in a lot of cases, you're actually going to be in the middle towards one side or towards the other, you know. And, um, and you can see like things like Bodhi brought back like that watermelon hash plant. And I think that was a Nepalese, if I remember right. And it's like, it's really cool. It's rough. It's not like a big yielder, but you can take it and make hybrids with it. And it's something novel that adds a new thing to the mix. And um, sometimes just the stems growing in a different pattern through the flower or the, the pods, the bracts actually getting a different shape or um, a resin head forming a different shape with a different different place where it breaks off or any one little trait could be like this really valuable thing and it doesn't have to be it doesn't the, the whole thing doesn't have to be good altogether you might just go oh I, I needed that one thing now I incorporate that into what I'm doing make sure that it stays and then now you've just improved things by using that one valuable little thing. And in some cases, you might get something like the Mazar seeds that I got. And you're like, these are just good. Just make more of these and you can grow this. This is killer weed. You don't need to do anything to it. It's already a very good type of weed to grow. And in other cases, you might be like, oh, I grew some and they weren't very good. But I think there's going to be something really good in here somewhere. And maybe you grow out a thousand and all of them suck for everything that you were hoping you might get out of it, you know? And, and at the same time, it's still worth making at least some seed of those ones that you can't find anything valuable in because the fact that they don't have any of the desirable traits that you want means they're not like the things that you're keeping already. And it might have a trait that you don't know is valuable yet. Because we only know what traits are valuable when we, we have a use for them. But you might not understand that, like I said, it's carrying a resistance to a disease you haven't faced yet. So all of a sudden, if you go, oh, there's this new fungus and it just did this one mutation. And now for some reason, it kills all OG Kush and we can't figure out anything to do about it. And you take this one thing and it's total shit. It's not good for anything. 
but it never gets that. And you cross it with your OG clone and you grow out the seeds and you get some that are just like OG, except they don't get killed by the fungus and you breed it a couple times. And now all of a sudden, guess what? You just saved your favorite weed. So you don't know, you know, like if things are different, they're still worth preserving. It's just like, you ain't going to grow this shit, but it's worth making a bag of them and sticking them in the fridge. Because you might get to a point where you go, okay, we tried this, didn't work. We tried this, didn't work. You know what? We got like three other really weird, shitty things and they're not good for anything. But we don't know because we never had this thing to face. You don't know what a quality of something is until you face the new challenge that it might be good for, you know? So there's there's that too. And that's an important aspect of preserving land race, you know? Man. <clears throat> Seed banking, like a real seed bank. I'm saying we call ourselves seed banks. We sell seeds online and so forth. However, seed bank, when you're banking that, uh, that that's a beautiful endeavor. You're doing like mankind a favor, dude. Yeah, I mean, and I'm just like, like for me, like there's there's only like a little bit of stuff like that that I've that I've done. There's been some really odd things that I had, and I was like, well, these are cool. I'm not gonna grow them, but I will stick them in the fridge. I'm not gonna lose them. But I don't do it that much. I kind of do what I want to do, which is make like my favorite weed. I want to have the best bag of weed in, in my pocket and the best plant growing in my garden. But um, it doesn't mean that, that those things don't have value. And there does need to be people who are doing all those different things, you know. And um, as much as I can... I'd like to like preserve everything that I get my hands on that I know isn't the same as something else. If somebody's like, oh, I got this, you know, it's basically, uh, it's basically cookies, cross OG, cross whatever. And it, and it's kind of what I would expect. Then I'm like, that's cool. It's very usable. We could do something cool with it, but I don't feel as responsible for it because I know a lot of people have that in the fridge right now, you know? But like I got some stuff from my buddy years and years ago and he was like, I got this thing. It's from Kentucky. It's supposed to be really cool. Um, you know, like they were supposed to be skunky and I grew them. I wouldn't say they were really skunky. They were kind of foody. They smelled weird. They were acrid. They weren't sweet. One got very purple. They looked nothing like any plants that I've ever grown. And they were neat and when they finished the seeds were like dark dark like black seeds and they were just beautiful and i've never grown it since but i made the seeds and i stuck them in the fridge you know and i try to do that with things here and there that i know are like okay this is a this is a neat thing and uh you know like i recommend that as much as people have the time and the energy to do stuff like that if you get your hands on something and you know it's unique Everything doesn't have to be a cash crop. Everything doesn't have to be the hot new release of seeds or any of the stuff that people are always looking at in our current paradigm. Like, oh, this is, you know, people always ask me, what do you think will be the next big thing? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, what's the next good thing? What's some good weed? Like, just have some good weed. If people like it enough to grow it, it's plenty big enough, you know? Um, you know, if it's something, something that's cool, then keep it around. And if, um, if it's completely different, even if you can't see the value in it, like I said, there's unknown, there's unknown unknowns, as they say, right? There's the, there's the known knowns, you know, there's the known multiverse. Yeah. And then there's the unknown knowns in the multiverse, the multiverse of, 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 of cannabis land race, you know? So, I like, to, I like to call it the marijuana multiverse because I'm taking back ownership of that word just on cool. a personal. I'm on I a personal had a vendetta. With any of the words. You know what I mean? I don't care. I still call it dope. People are like, dope? That's heroin. I'm like, I don't know. I've been called dope grower for decades. So, like, you know, a little dope patch. I got no problem with it. And when you smoke some really good weed, you're like, whew, that's some fucking heavy dope. Holy shit. Sometimes it's it hits you like it's some, some fucking drugs, you know. And it's like this is not an herb, sir. This is not an herb. <laughs> all right. It all depends, you know. The only person I've heard talk like that is uh, is Kevin. You know, calling it dope. You know. Yeah. Um, a, I'm sorry. It's a more old school thing. It's not really something you hear when usually when people 
say dope they they're taught you know dope in general like you know up here if you hear somebody say shit they're talking about crank they're talking about meth you know if you hear them say if you hear people say dope in general people are talking about you know heroin but um but you know dope growing growing dope that's been a thing you know since i was a little kid so absolutely man that's so cool now uh talking about speaking of growing dope man you were kind enough to um get me started with uh first uh initial limited offering from freeborn selections and um you know in this bag we have some hollywood pure kush crossed to the jaro f3 uh could you please elaborate on on what what the uh the providence the providence that's a fancy word just the background information behind the hbk and the jaro so the pure kush is an interesting one because there's several pure cushions. Um, I've been told by various people that what I call Hollywood pure cush is what is supposed to be called Hollywood pure cush and not the others. I've also been told that ooh, the type that I have is supposed to be called Topanga Canyon pure cush. And I can't, I can't say exactly what I have is versus these other cuts, having not done a thing where I grow all of them side by side. I have grown the Topanga that Kev has, and it's definitely like the same genetics, if not the same plant. Um, but I got it as PK, and it came from Hollywood right off a of sunset. And um, that was a dude who basically had all the different OGs fairly early out, not as early out for like the OG LA guys, but as far as like, you know, early 2000s, this dude had all the different OGs running through his house. And he mainly had three basic types, one like what people would call the SFV um, and would like encompass all those that are like that which would also be like what people call ghost, what people call, now they're all different, don't get me wrong, but they all smell like what you think of as a classic OG. Then there was another one that smelled like what we call gump, which is something that I've been pulling out of the double limes a lot. And it was a lot more citrusy. It was like a lime mandarin kush. And it looked more, a little bit more sour headbandy where it wasn't like the golf ball, pine cone, no leaf OG. It was a little bit more, a little more out there and nipply and different. And it was really, really fire. And I still don't know what the hell that was. That was something different. And then the other one that he had was what they called PK. And he was like the PK, that's the one. And it was um, just for whatever reason, those batches. And at that time it was like the, the, the hitter, it was the stronger one. Um, it tasted more, it hits you harder in the head and the lungs. And that, that's the cut that I have. Well, uh, you mentioned the early two thousands. Now I know the Hollywood pure Kush as 91 Hollywood pure Kush, And I've grown it. Thanks to have it getting the cut from Kev years ago. These, this has no relation, correct? The one that Kev has that he calls Hollywood Pure Kush is like a Bubba in a sense. It is more like what my Hindu is, where it's squat and it's very frosty and it doesn't smell like OG. It smells more like Bubba. And that is... Um, Bubba's acrid? Bubba's... It's like fuely? Bubba's... It's like, I don't know. I mean, as I understand it, the one you're talking about is the more like deep, earthy, cushy, Afghani. It doesn't smell like OG, right? No, it's really fuely. It smells strong. It's like, you're like, damn, it's going to get me fucking high. Yeah. But I mean, does it smell like OG Kush or? It smells cushy. It smells really strong. It smells uh, distinctly like turbo Kush, you know? <laughs> I don't know how to say it, you know? Okay. Yeah, so I mean that that one, like I know the plant by look. Like I've seen, like I've it's I've bright seen, green. I've seen yeah. the plant in people's hands of what Kev calls the the Hollywood, and then the one that he calls Topanga is the one that's closer to what I'm talking about. If you've ever seen his Topanga, 
Ah. It's like OG. It's just straight OG. It's viney. It has little leaves. They're really narrow unless you get it real happy and then they get real thick and different. And it has like these little branches. And like if you don't grow it perfectly, you get little tiny buds. And if you grow it perfectly, you get big, fat, awesome buds. And it smells like baby powder and marshmallows and a little bit of 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 like chem d funk in the back if you grow it the right way but it's not always there and it smells like fruit loops which is basically like artificial lime and then it smells like og and the ones that smell like that are the malibu the topanga and the one that i have and i can't say if the other ones are sisters s1s of it what they are all i know is that the one that i got was before I ever heard any name of any other thing, it was just PK. It was Pure Kush. And I got it from Hollywood, so I've always called it the Hollywood Pure Kush because it was like the one that was running Hollywood. Like, if you were a big dope dealer in Hollywood in like 2004, 2005, around that time, everybody was like, you gotta have this shit. And if you didn't have that one, you didn't have the baddest kush. The other ones were like, oh, these are good. But that was the one they were like, no, dude, you guys got to grow this and give this to us because this is the shit. And it was like being sold for like, you know, 150 and eighth at fucking clubs, you know, it was a, it was like really the hitter kush at that point. And um, so, you know, not, not a, not a, not an Afghani like squat gnarly looking Bubba master Kush type plant, like the one that I think you're talking about. It was like, you know, very viney, really a bitch to grow. And if you know how to grow it, it kicks ass. It's a great plant. But if you don't, then it's like so wimpy and difficult and loves to get attacked by powdery mildew if you're not on top of your shit. And, um, you know, it's a challenging plant, but it was like weed that was on a level where people were like, dude, what is this? And I've even seen it grown like a lot of times where it was like, that ain't it, even though it was it. It was the clone, but it ain't the product because you got to be able to grow it. It's just sour diesels like that. Like you can see diesel and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then someone grows it really good and you're like, I need this cut. And it's like, that's already the cut you have, dummy. You just can't grow it, you know? And, uh, and so, so it's that. And then the Jaro was the sour diesel cut that I got back around the same time. And back then I had taken the Hindu and hit it with the black affy seed that I had pulled a male out of it and made, um, Hindu affy cross. And I put that on the pure kush. And then I took a male out of that and I put that on the sour cut that I had. This is early 2000s, you know, 2004-ish, 2005-ish. And then uh, I guess the, I guess to be more accurate, the sour cross wouldn't have been made probably until 2007. And then that was what I called Jaro. And um, so the Jaro, I grew it over time, made different versions of it. And one of the F3s that I made of it that I really liked um, a pretty nice gassy one that brought out a lot of crazy cushiness and stuff. Um, I took that and put that on the, on the PK and that's what those seeds are. And they come out nice there. They're more PK than Jaro, but they have the influence of the Hindu and stuff in there where they're, they're, um, I don't know. They're, I, I call it like spiny. They're like, they're very like, they're, they're, bracts really like stick kind of straight out everywhere it's like i don't know hard hard to describe properly but it's like kind of like cactusy or something it's cool i know what you're saying i know exactly what you're saying and that's how i remember kev's hollywood pure kush it's like it's like you know, that. that's the funny thing about all this and all this roundabout way this weed in these seeds is actually kind of similar to the pk that this is not you know what I mean? Because it has the Hindu and the black affy added to it in the background there. It brought out part of the, of the genetics that are in all of it that make it wind up being as opposed to being more like the, the PK that I have, which is more of a, 
I don't know. It's a, it's, it's different. It's not quite, this made it like more neatly shaped and more even more fractal, if that makes sense. Like more like, it's like a repeating pattern. Whereas the, the PK that I have, when you grow it really good and it gets big and fat, it's a little bit messy almost. It's like, yeah, describe, but it has a lot of the little tongue shaped leaves sticking out everywhere. And it's a little bit more kind of knobby and everything, you know, whereas the, 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 the hybrid, it, it has a little bit more of that neatness that you'd associate with like a Bubba Kush or something like that. But it's still very much more like the PK as far as the resin and the flavor and the smell that it gets and stuff. It's a nice, um, it's a nice place to find an OG that is more easy to grow and more vigorous and uh, easier to get to do the right thing, you know? Uh, I was thinking fractal, man. That's such a cool way to say it. I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, now, I think something like uh, Jesse Biovortex would say, I just want to share that with you. Um, you know, so if I were to, you know, for a grower, so this is for like a novice grower can pop these, um, you know, and any, any consideration if I were to grow these out as an example? I mean, in general, the, the, the main things that I tell people is like, you don't want to try to push things with food. You want to give them enough food that they're happy. You want to flower things when they have enough room in their pots that they're still going to be happy while they go into flowering and they haven't kind of stopped growing and they're done because they don't have enough room. Um, and you, at the same time, you don't want to, um, you don't want to drown their roots by giving them water all of the time and having them overwatered. You don't want the soil to be way too dense. And if it is really dense, because dense soil can be nice, actually, it's really easier to fit nutrition in it and everything. But if you do um, have more dense soil, then you need to like, you know, lay off the watering a little bit, let the roots get, if anybody's ever paid a lot of attention, if you keep everything soggy all the time, when you go to transplant, your roots are very much smooth and they're all where they are. And they kind of are, you can tell kind of restricted. And if you let things get to the point where they dry, but they're not overly dry to the point where like your soil shrinks up, but you let them get dry to the point where, you know, they're, they're not soggy all the time. You'll notice your roots are everywhere and they're fuzzy and they're, they're happy and they're doing stuff. And when your roots are like that, you're going to have really nice, happy plants. And if they're not, then you're going to wonder why your shit's fucked up all the time. You know, like you really watering schedule is really, really big. And, Conversely, on the other side, if you have plants and you're letting them get way too dry all the time, you're going to notice when you go to transplant them, you look at the roots and you can see that the roots have actually been stifled and they've died back from getting too dry or getting um, too, too hot, but basically too dry. They're just like, they're like, okay, you're basically wilting your roots. And the same thing happens to them when you do either or, and you'll notice that in either case, the nutrition of your plant will be totally screwed, you know? So it's it's basically a matter of, um, you know, you're killing your roots one way or the other. So you wanna try to find that happy medium, especially with things that have OG in them because OG does not have the strongest roots. It's not like, you know, there's some things that have really strong roots and it's really hard to water them too much and OG is not one of them. And, um, you know, a lot of this stuff that is like the best smoke, it's the incorporated OG into it because it's one of those things that it imparts that quality on everything you cross it with, you know? And, uh, and this one is very much a, is very much a cush, but it's more forgiving than like most OG clones. So it's still easier to grow, but that's like always, and that's not just the OG stuff, but the whole watering over the years, I've learned like a lot of deficiencies people have are because their watering is off. If you let them get too dry, it looks like a huge nitrogen deficiency. You shed all of your bigger leaves. They turn yellow. They eventually dry out and you're like, oh, I need to feed these things more. And then if you get them too wet, then they'll typically get more yellow towards the tips. You'll look like you have these really heavy 
deficiencies of all these different things and you go wow how am i deficient you like people are looking at the leaf charts going well it looks like it's manganese magnesium iron zinc boron nitrogen phosphorus potassium like yeah everything's deficient because your roots are not happy they're not getting any food and so you'll even look at it and go it looks like the ph is off and it's like well yeah it's because everything that's going on in there is on this on this like slowed down fucked up schedule where it's trying to absorb things and it's not happening you know so it's trying to get water from its leaves it's eating the leaves it's trying to get food from its leaves it's eating the leaves and you know you're just screwing everything up so that in general is like you know don't try to feed your plants as much as they can possibly take that's not helpful and don't um you know don't just assume that more water is better and you know if you're if you're realizing that and you're learning like oh i don't need to water so much also make sure they don't get too damn dry because you'll have the same things happen so making sure that your plants are evenly watered all the time over the years that's been the one thing that all the most mysterious problems with plants like they often get solved by this thing of like ooh, your watering schedule you know that's so funny jackson uh it's not because we're talking about water i've been this is a half a gallon here and those of uh people have seen me before uh i'm gonna ask you a favor dude i need like a one minute break uh to go take a piss real quick dude um and i'll be right back okay no problem man. Yeah, yeah 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 uh while i'm gone could you please talk about um why you named the jaro the jaro yeah yeah so i got a buddy um i got a buddy from jamaica named banna and uh he uh I, I would hang out with him a lot and he'd always check out the garden and he you know show me how to farm different things like tobacco and you know give me tips on like garlic and potatoes and all this stuff and dude lived in the country and he knew how to how to do a lot of stuff you know find find medicines out in the bush and um you know do all kinds of cool cool shit and uh so one year i was like hey i'm gonna grow you a plant right here i'm just gonna plug it in next to this other big medi plant and so i grew him this little plant and uh of course it was the, the sour cross with the, uh what i called the og coffee which was the pk hindu afi so i uh plugged in that little plant and when it was almost done he came over and i go hey come check out your plant it's gonna be fire you know and we go out there and he goes to look at it and he smells it and he goes yep yeah, this is bad weed you know this is a, this is this is some of the some of the most hardcore weed that i can remember seeing i was like it's good right it was just like a really good one out of the seeds out of the f1 and uh and uh he's checking it out and i told him what it was what it was you know he goes yo he goes, this is the baddest one he goes you know you gotta call it you gotta call it jaro and i was like oh yeah and he's like yeah because uh you know he's like he's like uh you know in jamaica the sound systems he's like jaro's the baddest sound you know he's like this is the weed this is the baddest weed you know you can just tell by smelling it it's also a dude who's been you know like bought like his first bed at back home in jamaica with like whatever you know 200 pounds of weed or something you know like in jamaica like weed was not worth a lot of money and so they'd grow like huge fields of weed and and sell you know weed was worth like a couple dollars us basically by the pound and you know they'd cut it all down and dry it all like on tarps and chop it all up and put it all in big big ass bags and shit you know and sell it all off like that and so he had been through like fields and fields of all kinds of different weed forever and then he moved up you know in the late 90s and and saw a lot of different weed and so you know he knew he wasn't like he hadn't seen that much weed so when he smelled it he just knew like oh this is special right here and uh so that that was how it wound up getting the name because uh, jaro is short for kilimanjaro which is the uh sound system in jamaica where like ninja man and super cat and a lot of other real famous uh famous dudes got their start um basically rapping on that sound system in the middle of the night in jamaica for years you know in uh in the uh, 70s and 80s and everything so 
they they were known as like being the loudest you know and being the and having the baddest the baddest songs and the baddest everything like if you wanted to have the baddest party like that was the dj you had to get you know was these guys so that was that's how i got the name and it stuck and so i just started labeling it all jaro and uh um funny enough you know when the weed dried and we smoked it wrong yep basically this and lime is like the best things we got here and that's what you know that's what would always be you know what we'd want to smoke back then dude no, cause you, all this time, dude. I mean, you got other uh, names of your strains like black lime. You can say maybe it's more enticing, uh, makes you more curious in the jarro. And all these years, I, I never had a clue what was behind the jarro, what the jarro was, and never really intrigued me because to me the name was just something I didn't understand. Yeah. And uh, no, it's some it's some serious shit, dude. And I love the story behind it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it's really good weed. And, you know, Jaro is basically like a less sweet root beer. It's kind of the same thing, just bred a little bit different. Root beer was cloned uh, probably the year after or that same year. That was like 2010, I think. So, you know, it's like all right in the same, the same time. The same male made both. And uh, the flavor comes from the male side on both of them, you know. Funny enough, when I made both crosses, what I wanted was the nose from the headband and the nose from the sour, but I just got more of the nose from what I called the OG coffee, which was the PK Hindu Afi, which is like that licorice, kush, um, you know, all those different little smells and notes that are in it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's killer weed. It's the kind of weed where like if people are like oh you got a joint and you smoke a joint of that with them they're like oh shit <laughs> you know we didn't know what we were in for now we're fucking high because you know you think you're gonna like smoke a joint and be like yeah cool all right i'm stoned you know but you like smoke it and you're like Whew, okay shit you know there's like waves of that like you know you really you you really feel it. it's it's euphoric is what it is you know so you'll get like the giggles all of a sudden or something you know and it's it's neat it's cool. And it always, I just would smoke it day after day after day after day. And I would always get the feeling from it that I wanted, you know, and, uh, OGs like that too. It just doesn't give me the feeling as much that I want. OG has a little more of an edge to it for my, whatever my body chemistry, my brain chemistry. When I smoke OG, I get a little bit more kind of paranoid and uncomfortable. And, um, Sometimes that's cool when you want to really know that you're high, but for me, I really want more like of like the euphoria. And so that's why the jar and the lime, I always liked more because they kind of make me happy no matter what. OG won't ne necessarily make me happy. It just makes me like, fuck, I'm high. Okay, cool. I'm high. But it doesn't make <laughs> have like a positivity of blast off for me, you know, whereas the jar and the lime, they have like, they make me feel positive. So, you know. I might not do that for everybody, but I've had a lot of group experiences where we all smoke like Jaro or cocoa or root beer or lime. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, okay. Everybody's having a really good time now all of a sudden, which is pretty cool, you know? Well, it's funny because I don't know you like that. Every time I see you in real life, I don't even really recall you uh, seeing you smoke. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I but will, I so to hear you say I like getting uh you know smoking the, these heavy strains, I think it's dope. Yeah, um, I just don't know you like that, bro. I, I don't enjoy that much anymore smoking socially. Like at a certain point, I started to realize that the that I'm not really shy and I'm not really antisocial. I was just really stoned for decades, so I would just like be like, dude, I don't want to hang out with all these fucking people. Like, fuck these motherfuckers. Like, I'm gonna just go, you know, and you like think you're super edgy like meaning not edgy like in the modern sense that people say but like that you're that you like don't really you just don't like want to be around people and shit and then after a while i realized like oh weed's a little different for me I, when i smoke weed i like to smoke with people who i'm like really close with and then i have a really good time or i really enjoy smoking by myself and being introspective and planning and thinking about things that i need to do and when I try to get really high around other people, I have trouble like keeping up with what's going on and remembering what like I'm talking about and what's 
you know, answering people in the right time frame. And then like, I, like, I'm like, I have something that I'm going to say. And then I like miss the opportunity to say it. And then I'm just like sitting there going, Oh, I was going to say that, but fuck, I just get like way too blazed, dude. And, and it wasn't like having a super high tolerance ever helped with that. I realized I'm like, wow, my behavior and my outlook on shit was like pretty altered by being super fucking blazed from the morning through every fucking day. And it's not like I couldn't hang in there, but as soon as I started going to like events and shit and I would just be like, okay, I got to work. So I'm not going to get high because I want to be on top of my shit. I was like, well, I really like talking to strangers. This is pretty cool. I never did this before. I always only liked a couple people when I was like, man, fuck this, you know? And then I was like, oh shit. I was kind of, uh, I was a little bit antisocial from fucking being so smoked out. So like, you know what I'm saying? Like if, if me and you were somewhere, like I'd be like, fuck, let's get fucking blazed, you know? But I don't typically, like I don't show up like at the, at places and get super blazed. I'll get, I'll get like fucking high as a kite. I'll smoke like a fucking spliff with tobacco and get totally fucking ridiculously high at a party at my buddy's house when I'm going to be there or something, you know? But I kind of, I realized I was like, I thought that I was kind of like quiet and not very social for a lot of my life. And then I was like, dude, I'm just fucking super fucking baked. Not to mention it would have maybe been different. Like now I'll bring certain weed to smoke if I'm going somewhere social. So I'll bring something that's like really clear headed. Like I'll smoke root beer, or cocoa or lime. I will smoke those when I go places, but I avoid when somebody's like, here, try this, try that. Cause I'm like, fuck, that might just be the shit that totally is going to be that couch lock weed they're enjoying cause they're smoking it every day. And in the meantime, I've been smoking all this more euphoric cerebral shit. And then I smoke that and I'm like, all right, I don't know what the fuck's going on over here. I just want to fucking probably go chill by myself. <laughs> you know, like, so I just don't do it that much. That's why I don't smoke that much socially. Last time I seen you at the sticker farmer, you know, I went over there and they, and Doug gave me a fucking, fucking dab and I'm sitting there hitting the fucking Puffco or whatever. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm not getting nothing. I'm not getting nothing. I'm not getting nothing. Oh, I'm getting a big motherfucking hit and I blow it out and I'm like still blowing out after like three breaths and I'm like, all right, you know, I'll probably be kind of baked now. I don't know what the fuck I'm smoking here, you know, it was, it was bomb. It tasted good. But then when I saw you, I was standing out there and I'm like, you're like, yeah, you give these guys a shout out. I'm like, I don't feel like doing a shout out, dude. I don't want nobody pointing the fucking camera at me. I'm too fucking stoned. I feel weird. Yeah, like, I remember that. People are going to see this. What the fuck? You know? And then I was like, you know what? Who fucking cares, dude? Don't let that shit, you know? And I'm like, oh, what up, guys? And it was all good. But, like, you know, it does that to me. It makes me kind of, like, um, it's it, it, it turns you from being somebody who I know pretty good to all of a sudden being like, man, I don't really know. I don't really know Danny that much. I've only met him, like, maybe, like, five or ten times. Like, we've chilled. I know he's my boy, but fuck dude like I don't, I don't i don't know if i know him like that i get all weird and high and shit and i go fuck i did this for a long time and i never really realized that it was the weed i just thought i like, can relate to that bro. i just thought i was a criminal you know <laughs> no no 100 that's exactly what i've seen is that no, you get high right and you're like dude can i really trust this guy like you know what the fuck's really going on here am i protected here am i protected there because yeah that's how you end up slipping in the game man is Letting the wrong people into your life, and I learned that the hard way, dude. Starting yeah. off with the first chick I fell in love with, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I think you're good at that. By the way, I think you're pretty good at that. I dude, I I had the I had the I had the paranoia of being like you know a weed dude for a really long time, and then if I don't smoke weed, it really alleviates a lot of it. And I can just be like, oh, I'm a normal dude. Cool. I'm whatever, whatever. And then I smoke weed and I'm like, dude, like, you can't be talking about weed with everybody. Like, you know better than this, man. What are you doing? Like, you fucking, you're like, 
fucking got you're telling everybody about all your weed and shit bro like just fucking stop it because the paranoia kicks in you know but it can be paranoia about all kinds of shit it doesn't even have to be logical so when you got something like 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 me doing this kind of shit like talking about yourself oh and these stories and oh yeah and whatever it's like when i get super baked dude i'll be like if i come in here and i get super baked my answers will be way more closed off be like yeah dude yeah you know i know ted i met him back in the day he's cool he's legit bro trust me he's cool good dude you know but if i don't smoke weed then i'm like yeah you know i met him here and i met him there and you know it's fucking that's how you were growing up huh is that how you were growing up what as far as being paranoid and everything no no, <laughs> no as far as like not talking to people or talking to people like that short answers or Oh, dude, it's in my, it's just like, yeah, it's like, that's normal for me. It's not normal for me to like, like I, like you will never in your life see me ask somebody what they do for a living. I would never do that. You know what I mean? I was joking with a friend of mine that showed up the other day and he was doing something with a shovel and I was like, oh, who are you burying? You know? And, and, uh, then he starts laughing and I go, I'm just fucking with you. You know, I would never ask you who you were burying. You know, just fucking, <laughs> just, just fucking around. <laughs> and I go, no, seriously. I'm like, dude, I, I go, I'm just joking. But dude, I, I wouldn't even ask. I would never even ask you what you do for a living. Like, it's not in my repertoire of how I interact with people. But like that, a lot of that too, like the, the weed doesn't help all that stuff. And so, you know, like now if I'm like at a weed show and everybody's there and they're doing their thing, I might ask, oh, what do you do? Because I know that it's okay. But from like my background, like you don't ask people what they do and not because I assume they do weed. I don't know what they do. Fuck who knows what they do. I don't know what they do. I don't want to know. I don't want to know what the fuck you do. Just good to meet you. Right on. You do your thing. And please don't ask me anything about myself because I don't want to talk about it at all. Mm. So that's why now, like when it actually is important, when you like have seeds and you want to tell people shit, like it's important for me to be able to not be stifled like that. And so now when I smoke, I like it to be a more introspective, meditative type thing, you know, where it's like, okay, cool. Like we go to the river. Oh, let's get fucking stoned as shit, dude. We'll swim around and shit, drink a beer, listen to some tunes, fucking go for a walk and shit. But like, you know, I can do all that. That's or if we want to work, you know, like I can sit here and, oh, let's work. Let's go do, let's dig some stuff, cut down some stuff, whatever we're doing. Yeah, I can do that. That's fine. But in social settings, I've never, I've never been good with it. And, you know, it's just the way weed affects me, man. It's just not, it's not that great for me for that, you know? No, that's what I'm getting to, bro, is I think it's really about, uh, it triggers you back. In my humble opinion, I'm not telling you about you. I'm just sharing with you my my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Is uh, I think it brings you back to because I remember selling weed in the 2000s and growing weed. And <clears throat> you met me. I was growing weed and shit. To take to handle my hustle every day, I'd fucking get ripped every day, dude, and just fucking get lit. Because at any moment, you get pulled by the cops. Or you're at, you're at the grow house. You know, you're living at the grow house, etc. So I, to me, I just, as a fellow professional, I feel like you don't like those heavy highs because it takes you back to that mindset growing up. And um, what was I going to say about that, though, regardless, is uh, uh, no, man. I think that's another thing is that the plot thickens because it's cool to learn layers about you. You know what I'm saying? And, and somebody who's as passionate as you are definitely has to have a history in the game. And like I said, I'm not here for you to divulge anything or to push for anything. I'll say that one of the things that I do admire <clears throat> about professionals in the triangle, including Ayana's dad, which Gil Grigori is well known as an activist in restoring the Atoll River Delta. If I, I'm pretty sure I said that right. Out in Edersburg. And, you know, what? when I ask him about anything to do with Dank, he like... He's not, he, he's smooth about it because he's a character. He's hella cool. He's an he's a old hippie, man. But like, he won't talk about it. He won't. And it's pretty, pretty admirable, you know? So, uh, no, I always suspected. I never knew like your personal history with it because, you know, like a professional, I don't think you talk about it too much. And it feels good to come out of the green closet, dude. Do you find it to be therapeutic to go and socialize with people? 
Yeah, I mean, I love it, you know, like it's it's just one of those trippy things. Like it's it's really interesting to see how many people, you know, being back in the day, you kind of might know that they're, you know, you know, there's people doing stuff and everything, but it's not, you know, it's not, you're only ever in close enough contact with a certain amount of people to be able to be like, so you, you grow, you're growing some weed you know like what's up with what do you grow like what how do you like to do it or what are you feeding or whatever is like that like for a long time it just wasn't that that wasn't something that was that's not a thing you know like um i kick myself all the time because there was all these people i knew who had these really cool seeds and i would have just never imagined like asking them for seed like that would have just been crazy like hey can i get some of those seeds from that thing like what the fuck are you talking about dude you know in reality, a lot of people probably would have shared seeds with me. But for me, I was just kind of like, that just, that seems crazy. Like that's stepping on toes like crazy. You know, that's their special stuff. You can't like ask them for that. That would be, that would just be dumb. Like why throw away a friendship to ask them for something? You know what I mean? Just, and then I realized like in hindsight, I'm like, that was way too overly polite. All they would have said was no, if I can't have them. Sorry, my bad, you know? But to me, in my imagination, was just like this, like, oh, shit, you know, and a lot of stuff like that. And that's, um, you know, just an interesting thing. It's a weird, I come from a very weird, you know, it's a weird perspective to have on things of being, uh, you know, I don't know, approach things strange when you, I don't know, it's a weird... No, dude, you've been immersed in this since, since young buck, dude. Nine years old, getting high with Ted. I just can't, I just try to imagine you, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, it affects your psyche, especially if you're like really um, driven and, and, and you're it's like, it really intrigues you. And I can, I see how you're sharp now and how your mind is now. And I'm enjoying this conversation so much um, that I can imagine you as a kid with this free space and free, literally free to roam, free will. You're in the community where it's popping. So <clears throat> it's, it's dope, man. And, I think we sacrificed a lot based on uh, based on how to whatever levels we chose to take ourselves with our with, you know, dealing with weed against the law. And uh, for me, I think a part of the reason why I enjoy this so much is because, yeah, I'll be the first to raise my hand to say that I sacrificed a lot of socialization, you know, just phones going off, pagers going off. And I think you I think you can relate. But for me, straight up here in San Jose. People don't want to be your friend or they want to be your friend because you got good weed, but they just want their delivery fast. They want you to deliver that shit quick and you can charge 60 bucks an eighth if it's the fire, you know, but besides that, it's like, you know, and also, I don't know if you've experienced this, but it's in Pineapple Express where the dealer mistakes his, his customer for a friend, you know, so there's all these kind of blurry relationships that that have the potential to occur. You get stuck having to smoke with your dealer in the, in the movie, I think was how it was kind of, right? But like, you're like, oh no, hey, hang out, man, you know? Yeah, I, that's, that's a- You know what I'm a, talking about? Yeah, yeah, no, there, there's a there's there's a funny thing there. I mean, for me, like I, I had a, I had like, I had the luck of, um, of being like, you know, I had a, I had a pretty good, um, that is one advantage that I definitely had as far as being where I was from was that there was at least like a core group of people where, you know, like I always, and that probably led to some of like the social anxiety and shit of being like in bigger groups. Um, like I was, uh, you know, like the people who I'm comfortable with, I'm very comfortable with because I'm just like, yeah, whatever. I'm just comfortable with whatever. It's like, I don't give a shit, you know, like I'm all the way comfortable. And then, you know, when I would go to like, whatever you go to, like, we always had like the cool festivals here, like Picnic or Reggae on the River or whatever it was. I always like comfortable with my group, but like not comfortable with like other groups you know like any other people it's kind of like oh and then somebody like introduces you to somebody and you're like oh okay this person's cool too it's like you know what probably most of the people are cool but 
the perspective that I had was always like, there has to be some kind of a, there has to be some kind of a connection there. Like if this ain't so-and-so's boy, then I don't know this motherfucker. And after a while, you're kind of like, even if it is so-and-so's boy, I still don't know this motherfucker. Because you're always kind of worried that like people are going to be a bad apple. You know, you, you wind up like, you wind up being like, oh, okay. You could wind up in a real bad situation really fast for various reasons, as you know, as you wound up in some of the worst you could imagine. But you just don't know, you know, like who people are. And so, you know, that was one of the things I think when you smoke a lot of weed, you get very paranoid. What I would typically do when I would go to social places was weed would be like my anchor. So even if I was like high on shrooms or acid or whatever, I'd like always have my weed with me. And if I felt a little bit off or I didn't know what to do or I was out of place or whatever, I'd go somewhere, I'd sit down and I'd roll a big fucking joint. And a lot of times I'd roll maybe another two or three right there. And if someone was around and I could tell like, oh, they wanted to smoke, I'd just be like, boom. Oh, Here's a big fat joint. Oh, you want a bud? Here's a bud. Whatever. And then that way, like, you have a context. You know what the fuck you're doing there. What am I doing here? I'm smoking some weed. You know what I mean? Because in reality, like, the social anxiety, you're kind of like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here. What am I supposed to do? I was talking to my boy, Humble Fun Guy, the other day. Is like, well, you are there and you're looking and you're like everybody else seems to kind of know like how to just have fun having fun i'm like i need a job i need a task i need a context i need something so after a while you're like realize like oh I've, i'm just smoking weed but the deal is if i go to an event and i start smoking weed that's all i'm doing i'm smoking weed that's it and I'll sit there and I'll smoke. That's what's funny about people like, oh, you don't smoke. Like, no, if I come to this event and I smoke, I'm not doing anything else. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to roll weed and I'm going to smoke it. I'm not really going to talk to you. I might have a drink. But mostly I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to smoke. And I'm going to listen to music. And I'm going to know what the fuck's going on. And I'm going to be so fucking high that I probably can't accomplish much else. But if I go to the event and I go ahead and go, okay, I'm not going to smoke right now. I'm going to go here. I'm going to stay away from getting super baked. And I'll talk to people, be able to ask what's going on with them, explain what this is that I have that I'm giving you or that we're trading for and all this kind of stuff and for the weed events. So like if I go to like, you know, like I really like to go to like uh, there's a reggae festival in Boonville called uh, Sierra Nevada World Music Festival. It's mostly they just uh, tickets went for sale like today, I think. Excuse me. Yes. So I like to go to that one because if I feel like getting like super baked, I know I can just go stand in the fucking crowd and I'll just watch the music. And I'll find you this year. I, f I feel Next at year. home doing that. And, you know, maybe say a little something to you, a little something to whatever. Boom. We're watching tunes. This is what's going on. But if I'm somewhere and the whole deal is everyone's just mixing and interacting and I'm super baked, I'm just going to be like, I don't want to fucking do this with my baked time. It's not what I like to do baked. I'm well, let me ask you this. I like the vibe, you know? <laughs> yeah. One of the cool things about the Emerald Cup, I've seen Tim Blake dance. I've seen him dance before. Uh, there's another older gentleman, man, barefoot and so forth. You know the vibes, dude. Wild. Do you ever, do you ever dance? Um... I mean, I, I, I do sometimes, but I have like a funny thing where I'll be there. It's another, I think it's another social anxiety thing. It's like, if I can get myself to dance, then I'm going to dance. But I can't get myself to dance usually. I'll be like, I just ain't really feeling this shit. But if it's like, if it's really my shit, if I go somewhere and it's like, okay, this is the shit. This is what I like. Then I'll be like, dude, I'm fucking dancing. You know what I mean? But for the most part, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be like, I just have a level, dude, of, of like, I don't know if it's because I'm from the woods or just because of like how You're I from am. from the Gizame. Possibly just because I'm way too fucking baked, bro. You know what I mean? Like, I just am like fucking, oh shit, you know, fucking paranoia or whatever. But, um, 
like if I if if if, if I like if I go and I see like a, like an artist that's like really what I really really like, and um, I'm really vibing out, I'll probably smoke a little less, and I'll probably drink a little bit of alcohol, and probably smoke my weed with maybe and I know people hate this, but I'll smoke my weed with some tobacco, whether it's a blunt or a spliff or whatever, it takes off part of the edge and makes it more of a stimulant. And I'll be more energized and I'll feel more like, oh, more vibey. And then like, then I'll, then I'll feel like dancing. But if I'm just like super, super baked, dude, like I get baked, man. You know, like I don't, I don't, I see how everyone smokes. I'm like, if I smoke like that, I ain't going to be fucking high anyway. You know, I see everybody like they're over there. They're like, yeah. I'm like I can smoke weed like that all day, dude. I'm never going to get fucking high. When I smoke weed, I'll like hit that shit. You take all the way in your fucking lungs, blow that shit out. You ain't got to hold it in, but you got to take it all the way down in yeah. your fucking lungs. And you take two hits like that, I'll be higher than these motherfuckers who are baking fucking three grams of fucking rosin sitting there. I like see everybody hitting, like everybody who dabs it. Go, <sighs> they go, oh, you get it all as soon as it goes in your lungs. I'm like, the fuck you do, dude? You got to, even if it's in your lungs, but that ain't in your lungs, they hit it like this. <sighs> This is your lungs. <laughs> That's in your lungs. You know what I'm saying? And the difference is huge. Sometimes I'll sit and I'll smoke a whole joint and I'll be like, dude, I ain't that fucking high. And then I'll roll another joint and then I'll take like two hits and I'll really be like, fuck, I don't know if I hit it really good. And then I'll hit it really good. <sighs> two hits like that. And I'll be like, fuck, now I'm blazed, dude. You know, it's a funny thing. Like, it's just, it, it's weird. But uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Smoking is a, it's a funny thing. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a personal thing too. I feel like people, people think like, oh, everybody else smoking this much dope. I got to smoke this much dope. Or, you know, fucking, I can smoke so much weed. Like, it's a big fucking talent to smoke a lot of weed. It's like, no, if you smoke a lot of weed, you got a shitload of tolerance and you ain't getting high. So the dude who's sitting there and he's smoking a fucking half ounce right now and he's like, smoking these motherfuckers got baby lungs. I'm like, uh, actually, you haven't been high for seven years, bro. You haven't. You haven't fucking copped a fucking buzz. Go ahead and quit smoking for two days. Smoke that joint and then you'll fucking feel high. But if you smoke high, if you're high 24 hours a day all the time, you never get high. It ain't an accomplishment. It's like a dude who eats shrooms every fucking day every day and he's like dude i can i can eat a fucking ounce and you're like yeah anybody can eat an ounce if they eat shrooms for the last eight days it ain't shit but quit for a fucking month and then eat an ounce and tell me what the fucking difference is and you're gonna be a lot fucking higher than you know what you're claiming it's just a funny thing you know it's like and I used I used to be in that mindset. I'd be like, dude, these fuckers can't smoke. You don't smoke shit. I smoke so much. I can smoke so much. Nobody can smoke as much as me. Fucking Snoop, Snoop Dogg don't smoke as much weed as I smoke. I can fucking smoke all day. Fucking, I give. There's no one can smoke more weed than me. We smoke. You talking about yourself, right? It, what's that? You talking about you? Yeah, yeah. Because that's because that's what happens. Because guess what? You build a tolerance to weed, and you don't get high. So you, it doesn't matter that you're smoking so much quit for a month come back smoke the amount of weed you were talking shit about then and then show me that you as a human can smoke more weed than anyone else because guess what you won't the only reason you can smoke so much dope because you don't get high so you're basically bragging about the fact that you don't get high <laughs> that's what you're bragging about whereas right. me if i don't smoke that much weed constantly all the time and then I go ahead and I fucking smoke two or three joints. Like I'm I'm way higher than you've it. been in the last 15 years. That's just how that's how weed works, you know? So like for me, I'm like, I I always smoked all the time. And I thought it was hot shit to smoke all this weed. And I thought it was fucking great that I can fucking sit here and give you this weed. And I'm fucking, I'm like, I'm like this with white eyes, and you're over there and you're fucking throwing up because the shit is so potent. But the reality is that it's only because I have so much tolerance that I fucking don't get high. And after a while, I was like, do I really want to not get high? This seems lame. 
I'm basically just putting all this shit in my lungs and I'm like getting nothing from it except staying normal. And then, you know, I don't really, I don't really think it's a big thing to boast about, but if you do it, that's great. If you want to smoke a quarter pound a day, right on. But don't think that like, oh, these baby lungs motherfuckers, they can't fucking smoke like me. Like all they have to do is smoke like you and they won't get high either. And then they can fucking smoke a fucking quarter pound a day too. Like we've all done it, you know, like we smoked, fuck, we smoked, I think four and a half ounces of honey oil when it was fucking a new thing in a weekend with four people. My buddy got hospitalized in Costa Rica after we left and went there a few days later and nobody could figure out what was wrong with him. And at the hospital, they said it was THC poisoning and they said that they had never seen anyone with so much weed in their body ever. And that he almost killed himself with THC. Now we didn't believe it and I still don't believe it, but it was fucking hilarious. And I mean, we smoked, you know, in a day we were each smoking fucking whatever, you know, nine grams of fucking honey oil in the days when it f fucking first started a piece or whatever that would break down to, you know, basically, uh, no, we smoked probably 15 grams a piece each day <laughs> or, or over the course of a weekend. Yeah. So it's a lot. But the reality of it was, was like, yeah, we, we were still not any higher than anybody gets when they're not a smoker and they take a ball get, you know? Now, if you take a non-smoker and you give them fucking 15 grams of honey oil in a weekend, sure, then that might be an accomplishment. But for people who smoke all the time, you don't get high anyway, man. You know? Like, good well, fucking... No, excuse me. I, I totally understand what you're saying. I totally I, I agree, 100%. You build the tolerance... What's been amazing for me, and um, I'm I'm keyed right now, and and I definitely acknowledge it, to take a break. You get, you can get super zooted. You will, you know, the longer the break that you take. Now, yeah. what's worked for me is in this position of GW Smoke Break. Like, I get to do interviews with you, and like, it's more of a conversation. But like, uh, you know what I'm saying? So I get to meet all the growers and so forth. And then when they give me buds, like at the Emerald Cup and so forth, like all these fresh terpene profiles and the different chemistries of in the buds. It keeps me fucking popping and you know like it's always zingy it, it, it um, does so. when you switch weed yeah yeah like when i like i'm talking about like yeah when i was when i was like that and i'd be like yeah i'm smoking so much weed i'm hardly high right and then i go to costa rica and get some shitty brick weed and smoke it and fall asleep on the couch after like a half hour wake up with a headache and be fucked up but still be hella high off a of weed that there's no way would get me stoned if i smoked it all the time just because it was novel and it was different, right? And when I say, uh, people gotta understand what I'm saying when I say I'm not getting high. I'm not saying if I smoke nonstop like a chimney that every time I light up a joint, I don't go, oh yeah, fuck, okay, now, cool. I'm stoned again. Like, yes, I am. But you're never gonna be able to be as high as the person who you're saying can't handle smoking. That person who can't handle smoking can't handle smoking as much as you're smoking right now because they have a low tolerance. So when when they smoke one joint and they get way too high and you sit there and you smoke 30 joints and you can't get way too high, who's higher? One person's way too high. One person <laughs> is high. I'm not saying you don't get stoned. I'm just saying that like obviously it's not a big thing to boast about because there's no way to make you get too fucking high. You can't. Well, you're saying you like to get like that. Well, I'm saying that I'm, I'm saying that like, it's just a different thing. I'm like, I'm, that's why I said it's personal. It's personal. If you like to, if you like to smoke nonstop, that's great. I, for years and years and years, I did nothing but smoke. I would wake up and I would take a leak and I would roll a fatty and I would smoke it. And then as soon as I did any other little task, well, I, shit, I fucking ate breakfast, fatty. I fucking drank a glass of water, fatty. I fucking filled some pots, fatty. I fucking 
planted some seeds, fatty, like bong, fatty, fucking vape, zorb, spliff, bong, fatty, hash, keef, fucking honey oil, fucking whatever. You know what I mean? You're getting high, 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 boom, 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 weed, 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 weed. That's great. It's super fun. If people like to do that with weed, that's great. But it's personal. It's a personal thing. It's what you like to do with weed. So at a point, I used to be just like the people who were like, oh, you know, baby long motherfuckers can't fucking hang with me. I can smoke so much dope. Like, yes, you still get high. Sure, you still get high. I'm not saying you don't get high. I'm just saying the fact that you can outsmoke everybody means you're not getting as high as them. <laughs> The people who get to the point where they're like, dude, fuck, holy shit. Like, you think that they just, like, have a weak composition? It's like, no, you have a really high tolerance. Like, if you go sit down right now with a junkie to go do fucking heroin, and the fucking heroin guy's sitting there, and he's like, oh, I just fucking did this whole fucking huge fucking pile of shit. And you fucking right now are all fucked up and fucking ODing and shit. It doesn't mean that that guy's really good at fucking heroin. It just means he has a super high tolerance and you don't. It's not the same thing. It's not like, oh, this motherfucker, he's fucking soft. He's fucking whatever. It's like, no, it is personal. Everybody's dosage of a various fucking chemical that goes into your bloodstream, it's going to respond differently. You know, it's like people be like, I can drink you under the table. It's like, yeah, you drink for breakfast, bro you don't get drunk does it mean you're not drunk all fucking day yeah those dudes are drunk all fucking day when you talk to them you know they're drunk but you'll never be able to drink them under the table because their tolerance is too high but it's just funny to me because i just see like a whole the, there's the whole people who are like you know uh the whole thing arises from from talking to you and you're like oh you don't you don't smoke and i'm like yeah but even though i smoke I still, at this point, I don't smoke like I used to smoke. And it's a personal choice because now when I smoke, I know the character of what I smoke. When I used to smoke all the time, mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh, okay, this doesn't get me high. It sucks. This doesn't get me high. Mm -hmm. It sucks. This doesn't get me high. But this Too one, cool for school. and all the rest, this is good. So now there's one or two kinds of weed that are good and all other weed sucks. But what you can't see is, <laughs> hey, this weed right here, this is really sleepy weed. This weed right here, this is really energetic. This one kind of makes me feel kind of dull. This one makes me feel like it's an antidepressant. This one's really happy. This one does this or this one does that. But when you're just smoking this fucking mishmash of all the different shit you have all the time, then the best you ever get is you're all cool. Now I'm high. I'm stoned. Cool. But you don't really like it's as like somebody breeding weed and you're trying to evaluate everything it's really challenging because all you know is what is like number one as far as being like the thing that still gets you really high and my favorites they still get you really high when you're a heavy smoker lime and jaro like you can smoke weed all day and when you smoke those you'll go oh i got a head change even though i just smoked fucking cookies and gelato all day these ones got me fucking high og will always still get you high sour diesel will always still get you high although it's usually more of a rushy high that kind of comes and goes you smoke it and you go, Ooh, okay and then it kind of mellows out and you smoke some more whereas og you'll smoke it and you'll get high for a while and these i'm saying even when you have a huge tolerance they have that quality because they're really potent fucking strong weed but the lime and the jar oh, they're like that it's just a funny thing to me to where uh you know people don't seem to understand that the real advantage that you have as a heavy smoker isn't that you're really good at being high you're not as high as the people who you think are not as good at being high you're just simply not because you have tolerance it's a chemical question it's science like you ain't that fucking high so don't boast about how, oh, I can smoke so much. Okay. If you really want to have that bragging point, then go ahead and quit for a month and come back and outsmoke everybody. And you won't. <laughs>
because you'll smoke a little bit and you'll be like, fuck, I'm super zooted. I need to fucking chill out. I need a fucking cup of juice. I need to fucking take a shower, go for a swim or some shit. I need some air, bro. I'm too fucking high, you know? And that's because it's about tolerance. And so, you know, and, and I say this as somebody who used to like to boast about how I could fucking smoke more than everybody. And eventually it was just like, you know what? It's not really, it doesn't matter. It's personal. So you can smoke a lot. Sweet, dude. Fucking, you know, like I said, junkies can fucking do a lot of heroin. You can't. You'll die. They can be bugs. <laughs> Alcoholics can drink for breakfast. You can't. You'll fucking be wasted. They're not. But it doesn't mean they don't get drunk. They do get drunk. They are drunk. Nobody likes them. They're drunk all the time. But, you know, it's just the point of it. It's funny because it's one, it's something that I learned over years and years. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can't outsmoke you because I'm tough. I can't outsmoke you because I'm fucking have a strong mind or a special body. I can outsmoke you because I have a routine where I build up my tolerance to be really fucking exceptionally high. And now you can't smoke as much as me, you know? Funny. Well, you know, the truth is, too, it's like, you know, a stoner can say, oh, well, I'm not pickling my liver. I'm not, you know, fucking myself up on, on some shit, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I'll say, like, with me, you know, having the freedom to get as stoned as I want, it is playing with that boundary because even though you're not harming yourself physically, like, I, I the healthiest that I've ever been in terms of, like, I've lost some weight and I'm eating really good. But like you can diminish your ambition. You can um, challenge your level of thinking clearly. Uh, for me, <clears throat> I like to get zooted and I, I start to think creatively and solution oriented. But I just want to be honest because I don't want to be like, hey, but no, bro. Like, look at me right now. You know, like I feel good right now. And, and I just want to be honest about that because I flirt with that almost on a daily basis. I've, I've done it, dude. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with being high all the time. It's just a, it's just a very in, interesting ego trip to believe as I did for a long time. I'm not talking about these things like pointing at everybody else and like talking. This is like what, what I'm. Oh, that's why I think it's so be, hilarious. Yeah, I can't yeah, imagine be, you like that. Be, because I'm, because I'm like, you know, like I, I did that and I thought it was like so impressive or whatever, you know, just because it's funny because you smoke with people, they can't hang. You just smoke, it's nothing. And then like at a certain point though, you gotta, you gotta realize like what the reality is. And then people, you know, people will hear me say this. I see on the, on the thing, there's people who are like, oh, I get high every time, you know, like, yeah, you get high every time. Everybody gets high every time. You're going to get high, but. No, I know exactly what you're saying. It's 100%. Not, it's, 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 you know, it's a different, it's a different thing. You can't just like right now, you know, if, if you smoke, if you smoke a little bit less, then when you smoke some really fucking strong dope, you're like, holy shit, this is really fucking strong. And you can get to the point where you get overwhelmed and introspective and you might be like, fuck, you might get the spins, you might get like way too high, like you're like fucking out there it's a very intense thing it's like a drug high it's almost like a trip you know and you feel it come on like mushrooms when you smoke so like way too much of something really strong but when i smoked all the time i would never even get the littlest bit of that yeah and then we'd smoke with somebody who wasn't used to it and they'd walk outside and throw up and lay down on the ground and you'd be like fuck i'm sorry bro like do, like you should need to like eat some sugar or maybe like take a shower or something like <laughs> fuck dude my bad you know and you'd be like laughing with your friends like dude we fucked this motherfucker up this is hilarious this dude can't fucking smoke you know and, and maybe it's funny too if somebody talks a lot of shit like they're the fucking you know like they can smoke so hard and all this and you know i get the whole thing like i'm straight dude i'm from it like i'm from i'm from the fucking space in the culture where like you you think you're the shit because you're weedier than everybody else like I'm the fucking epitome of that ego trip, you know, back in the day. But it's just one of those things where it's like, dude, you're fucking, it's up to, you know, if somebody, if I meet somebody and they like to smoke a little bit of fucking weed, I don't assume that they don't get high. Like if I meet somebody and I know they smoke nonstop all the time, I know that they really don't have the ability to get as high as that person that's kind of a rookie. 
person that's kind of a rookie, bro, like they can get high. They're good at it. They're not good at being high, but they're good at getting there <laughs> because they got a <laughs> fucking tolerance. So it's just a, it's a funny thing, you know, it's just, a, it's just, I don't know. It's just not something that, you know, something that I know. No, I think it's really cool. I think it's dope. And, you know, to, to kind of point out what, what you're saying. And, and I think what's really cool is I think you have an active mind and, you know, you're really, um, how can I say this? It's it's hard to know where you stand in the scheme of things when you're just operating with a tight circle. And now that the world has changed, um, you're, you're able to see that based on the feedback you get and so forth. It seems that, you know, your, your work is distinguished and, and it comes from you and, and so forth. Um, so what I'm saying is that earlier I compared you to Jason Gelman in terms of having an upper hand based on being second generation. And then again, dude, uh, it's funny how we get to learn from each other, uh, learn about you in this case. That's what I'm trying to say. Jerry Savage from Savage Farms. I did a four part mini series. He's from Edersburg. He, uh, you speak to him today. Uh, he's a man of like few words on a bad way, you know, uh, and, and he's really chill, really calm. Uh, but his rep when he was, you know, growing up in Edersburg was he's like rowdy and I guess kind of like a party animal. And, you know, I, I guess that evolved into like pushing it pretty hard when it came to growing herb and shit out in EB. Um, and so with you, I feel, I, I'm just getting this picture. Like when you were a youngster, you were you out for a rep? Were you, I mean, like, I don't think you breathe now for a rep, you know, but when you're young, it's like, you want to make your mark. You want to be like, yeah, dude, I can hang. And if you're smoking weed at nine, I remember selling weed. I was like 17, 18, 19 years old. This kid, he was like 13 years old or 14 years old. I was selling him weed and shit. And he was a little fucking badass little kid, dude. Fucking live wire little motherfucker, dude. Never forget that kid, dude. He get ace off me like every three days or I don't know how often, but yeah, man. Have, is it the same with you? Like, were you a lot different back then? I mean, like we, I don't know. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's a mix of stuff. I'm a funny <laughs> person because I like always, I was always exposed to like the stony hippies who were like spiritual and fucking, you know, like having crystals and fucking shit like that you know what i mean and then also you know we thought we were we thought we were like little badasses and and uh and uh you know fucking rude boys you know so i don't know it's a funny a funny funny balance of stuff like that but definitely um definitely was on more of an ego trip than I would like to have thought I would be on. Like looking, you know what I mean? Like I, I've constantly gone and it'll be, it'll literally probably be like, you know, next month or next year or whatever. I'll like look at myself and I'll be like, man, you were such a fucking dumbass last week or whatever, you know? Cause you're constantly trying to be like, have your head on more. There's so many interactions I've had with people where I was like, dude, you're such a fucking asshole or like you know you know, what the fuck were you doing or what were you thinking or whatever it was and like I, i'm 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 glad that at least that i'd prefer to be better you know what i mean but at the same time like i can't um i can't like discount the fact that uh you know that my nature is a little bit out there you know um as far as like yeah i don't know like making a name i was never really concerned with that so much but definitely uh yeah i don't know man i don't know quite how to describe it i mean i mean that would that's a that's uh, that's in the ballpark of something you wanted to be the man and you know why this isn't no psychoanalysis or nothing like that i'm no, saying no, I, i'll never forget i like this kind of shit because it's introspective you know it's like all right like what what would i really say about that did i want to make a name for myself like in reality probably not specifically but you said ted's the man 
and and I've never heard you talk about a fellow professional like you did about Ted when that happened. And I'll never forget it. it just the way you said it, I was like, damn, like Jackson looks up to this guy, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. Uh, it makes sense. You know, you that's what I mean. Like there's, it's like I said, you know, he's not the only guy, but he's one of those guys. He's one of those guys that as, that as a youngster, you're like, okay, this guy's got his shit together. He's, you know, he's, he's smart and he's hardcore and he's, um, you know, he's, he's a good role model in my opinion. He's a, he's a good person in general, you know? And, uh, I would say that he, I could say that he is somebody who wasn't out to make a name for himself. He was out to make a life for himself, right? His towards <laughs> elevating his life, helping his folks, doing good like that. And I would say that I couldn't, I couldn't probably say that I was on the same level as him with being what I would call cool, meaning like, you know, good, you know what I mean? Like, oh, he's cool. He's a cool dude, you know? And I don't mean like cool, like, man, he's cool. I mean like, no, he's a cool dude, you know? He's cool, he's chill, you know? I wasn't, maybe, maybe I wasn't as chill. Um, but, um, probably yeah i probably had more weirder ideas of how things are and was a little bit more out there and um maybe well bro you're like nine more, years old you know what i mean that's young dude so it's like i can't I, the only reason i can relate to that here in san jose i went to private christian school my whole life yet it's like you wonder how do i fit in how do i like you know how do i do this how do i do that and I didn't start smoking weed till I was like 16, 15. <coughs> but um, I can imagine having the psyche, you know, or just again so young, immersed in that in the world, this multiverse. It's like, oh, you felt you felt a sense of belonging, you know. Yeah, well, and there's a messed up thing too. And I don't think that it's really, I don't think that people understand it enough. Uh, but when you do um, basically when you take something like weed and the people who are involved in it know firsthand that it's cool and it's okay, right? And you vilify it. So I know for a fact, it's, a, it's put it this way, when you tell kids all drugs are the same and then they try weed, right? It's well known that all of a sudden they go, oh, they must have been full of shit about all drugs. I might as well fucking smoke coke now. So it's real important to tell kids, hey, weed is different than aspirin, is different than caffeine, is different than fentanyl, it's different than heroin. Every chemical is completely different. There's not a thing called drugs. There's particular chemicals. There's one called mercury. There's one called fucking water. There's one called fucking oxygen. They're not all the same. They're all different fucking things, right? So when you take somebody young, in my opinion, and they know that weed is okay, but it's thrown in with all these crimes. So now replace my... my previous idea as an analogy for crime instead of chemicals right so now imagine that when you tell a kid that weed is this horrible crime and that's how society looks at it even though i know that's fucking bullshit right then naturally what it does to your brain is it makes you think that that crime's not so bad you know what i mean so it changes your whole perspective on society because you go from thinking, you know, things you're basically like, so what, what the fuck is, what is everybody talking about? Like, you know, this shit's all bullshit. Rules are bullshit. Laws are bullshit. All that shit's bullshit. 
So then it takes you a lot longer, I think, to really know that ethics and morals and everything that's really in truth what's good, right? That that stuff is good and stands alone, not because society says so, right? So it makes things a little bit weird when you analyze things as a person, especially as a young person where you're like, whoa, okay. So basically squares are a bunch of bitches and society is fucking bullshit and it's all fucking backwards and everything's totally fucked and it makes no sense. And then it takes you a long time to go, hmm, no, that's not how it is. That's not how it is at all. Everything that is moral is moral because of your conscience. It's not because of laws. It's not because of this or because of that. But <laughs> how do you do that with something like weed to a whole culture of people to the level that they did it, then you get a lot of people who are like, okay, so this is going to be a little harder to make sense of what is good and what is bad. You know what I mean? And uh, so then it's easy to think that, um, you know, people should be vigilantes or people should completely govern themselves or people should live completely outside of society or most of the people who you meet they're not like you and all those basic ideas that for normal people would be like what what are you talking about but that's what they do and they do it to huge groups of people and weed people are one of them and there's a lot of other groups not to get into like politics and shit but like there's it is how things are. And when that happens, it causes these waves that wind up to where you're, you're looking and you're going, huh, well, why do these people behave like this? Well, these people behave like that because they've been basically turned into an other group. And when you turn people into an other group, then it's really hard to figure out which part of you is not the other which part is part of the core group that shares all the principles with humanity that are all what it is. Because you're like, hmm, we're not treated the same. We're not told that we're the same people. So who the fuck are we? You know what I mean? And that's what the war on drugs did to a lot of different people. And you don't notice it that it happens, you just look at the world really weird until at some point it strikes you and you go, oh, shit, okay. So I definitely need to re-examine this antisocial undercurrent to everything that I fucking do, you know, and realize like, oh, okay. All right, people are pretty cool. Shit, I missed out on that for fucking 25 years or whatever you know what i mean because you're thinking like oh i'm not i'm not those people i'm this other thing you know it's really trippy man and it's a uh, it's an interesting thing interesting thing that happened with uh with all that but that's what that's what that puts in your head as when you're a little kid and you're like oh i can't talk about what is going on because it's you know we're not okay. We're the bad guy. Oh, shit. So then once you're the bad guy, you're like, fuck it, I'm the bad guy, you know? Shit, I don't really have to worry about any of this shit. Like, we'll just do some bad shit, you know? And luckily, I never did anything that was really that bad. But in your head, you just assume that, you know, you're those other guys. You're the bad guys. You're not the, you're not part of, like, the good guys. Those guys are, those are some other shit. And at the same time, I knew that, the, that we were the good guys on levels that other people were not the good guys, if that makes sense. 
the hippies with the fucking crystals and the goats and shit. You know what I mean? Like, oh, okay, well, I know this is good from experience, but I also know that this isn't the good that those guys think is good. The squares, you know? So, I don't know. Weird, a weird thing, but a trippy thing because you, you know, that's just how you, it's how you, you, how you, your perspective dictates how you process everything. That's your software, right? So you wind up with these really weird perspectives and it takes you a long time to realize like, oh, okay, all right. So, you know, back to your question, like, did you want to make a name for yourself? Well, not as much on the level that you want to like have everybody know who you are because you really kind of are afraid to have anyone know who you are, right? But at the same time, you almost do because you, like, I don't know. You know what I mean? A, kind of, a little bit of a, like, I don't know, the, you know, a little bit of a, of, a ba of a bad guy thing, you know? So it's a funny thing. And I think a lot of people that were in weed are like that. It's like, oh, yeah, you know? You think you're a criminal. It's like, you're not a criminal. You grow a fucking plant, bro. But the stigma is strong. It is a trip, you know? Really, really weird shit. No, well, I mean, unfortunately, it was criminalized. And so you get caught with that plan or trimming that plan or, you know, selling that plant. It's bad news, you know? And um, I think about that sometimes because I've experienced different personality types, maybe I don't know if archetypes is pretty heavy, um, but just different character traits in different growers and so forth. And I'm like, damn, dude, yeah, if you did really well for yourself, it means that. And for the guys that were born into it, basically, you know, it's just those perspectives. You've been very honest, you know, and I think it reveals a lot about the psyche of, uh, I would say, many, many uh, dudes and chicks that fit your shoes in, in that in that regard, you know. So, so I want to say thanks, man. It's super. It's cool. It's it's really cool. Um, and I think as we get older, you know, we see things different. And and you know, you have a, a boy now, and you know, I think when you have family, it definitely changes things. And um, I think the beautiful thing with with operators like yourself, and I say us, <clears throat> I'll put myself in that category for sure. I think I've I've earned my stripes, and uh, now I'm I'm making content. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I'm not, I'm definitely, I don't do seed work or anything like that, but as far as, you know, like a dedication, a, a sense of commitment, um, I can't imagine, you know, a, having a, a family and so forth. And, and the beauty is this like lifelong relationship that continues to age like wine and so forth. Um, and so before I, I let it escape me, you know, one of the wild things is that for you in your breeding work, you're, you've really we reached back. And you're you're touching like the Hindu, which is right here, and I have Chem ninety one written on there, dude. And I got this last time I seen you in Laytonville. Yeah. So, um, that one made sense to me because they're both clones that are from way back, and um, I think naturally they just are gonna. They're gonna make a really cool cross. They're both very potent. They're both nice and dense. Um, they, you know, they kind of fall into what I would consider kind of the same ballpark of, of stuff, but they're different. Um, but uh, you know, they 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 both have a cool. Uh, they're both very. In my opinion, like the chem is like Afghani heavy. And um, I don't know, I think they should be really cool. You know, those are those are really neat. They haven't been grown out yet. So if you pop them or somebody pops them, they'd be some of the first. People are about to start growing out some of those testers now and, uh, you know, see what they are. But I, I tried to do, I tried to use like a lot of things that were really like tried and true good breeding plants and favorites of mine um to put in there so that like if it worked i would have this stash of really cool stuff um and uh 
in case like the next time I try a reversal of the Hindu, it didn't work or whatever. I would have all these things to kind of draw upon. And um, so, you know, I did Chem 91, PK, um, Yeska, which is a cool OG, uh, Northern Lights 5 Haze, number 13, which was a cut that Skunk Tech found that was very Northern Lights heavy, but has a really powerful high on it. Um, a bunch of things, the cherry pie bag seed that I used to make cherry limeade, um, wild strawberry, which is a special cherry limeade selection, um, diesel, yeah. sour diesel, root beer, cocoa, uh, lime one, like everything that I like keep that that's really cool that I thought would mix with it. I put in there, there was a couple that I would have put in there that I kind of spaced out. But just everything that made sense or that was like something that I really like and that I thought might work with it, I kind of just tried them all and then hoped that I would get some seeds in all of them. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff, man. Um, but yeah, the, there's there's a bunch. And the, the Chem 91 specifically, Chem 91 Hindu, I'm like, I think is really promising. That, the PK, the Sour, um, I think they'll just mesh really well together. And I have already crossed the you know the afi cross hindu cross pk that was stellar so i'm like well what would it be like without the afi what would the jaro be like without the without the afi and the pk you know like there's i kind of have an idea of how things work and so um i think those ones will all be really cool in there i saw somebody in here said they don't want to grow the root beer because it smells like train wreck and the, the root beer smells like smells like um zero train wreck there's zero train wreck smell comes from terpinaline there's zero terpinaline in there there isn't mm -hmm. any in there the actual smell of root beer the drink has wintergreen and that's like the modern version once they took the sassafras out of it i guess but it's um it's uh it's not it doesn't have that it doesn't it doesn't have the toothpastiness that root beer has it's more like cream soda in a sense um or like sarsaparilla which is less on the uh doesn't have wintergreen so it, it, there's no terpinaline there's no train wreck uh jack smell in in that the only thing that i have that's released that has terpinaline in it is the cherry west and it has so many other terpenes in it that it smells pretty heavy of terpinaline but when you smoke it, it it tastes like fruit it has none of the taste carries through that's why i like it and I don't hate terpinaline, but as a breeder, it's a huge pain in the ass to introduce it into programs. And so generally, I don't use anything in my breeding program that uh, smells like terpinaline. <laughs> That's so cool, dude. Now, speaking of the Cherry West, I'm, I'm sorry? I was just saying, which is what people associate with train wreck is terpinaline. So I, I avoid it. I mean... You need a tiny, tiny amount of terpinaline to turn lemon into lime. And so I do have a tiny bit of terpinaline in my black lime stuff in all my lime work, but not enough to make it smell like train wreck, only enough to not smell like lemon peel and smell like lime peel instead. And so you can't detect it. You can only detect it as the change from, from lemon to lime so that it doesn't smell like lemon, you know? That's so sick, dude. That's so cool. It's gone to that point with the game, dude. Um, I'm holding a Cherry West Backcross 4. What can you share about this one, please? Uh, so that's what I was just talking about, the Cherry West. So that was uh, – originally I had the Candelabra, and the Candelabra was like um, this really amazing thing. It was one of the only plants that I ever grew that was really heavy on terpinaline that um, – that I liked and I, my buddy gave it to me. I was really excited. I started flowering it out and I went, eh, it smells like terpinaline. And I was super disappointed because there's a lot of things. If you're looking for it, it's funny. They say it's a rare terpene, but it's very easy to be in everything. And a tiny bit of it, just once it hits a certain threshold, your nose mostly just smells that. It's just totally makes you nose blind to everything else. You just smell terpinaline. So it kept budding and budding and budding. And then when it finished, I was like, damn, this thing actually smells like really gnarly. Um, it went from smelling like, from like kind of Jackie train wrecky to being like straight, like a fucking bottle of turpentine. 
And I was like, that's really raw. And then it dried and it smelled like everything. It was like, whoa, it's skunk weed, it's cat piss weed, it's pine, it's lemon, it's grape, it's cherry, it's strawberry. It's, it's just smelled like everything all in one weed. And I was like, that's fucking crazy. And so I hit that with the same mail that I used to make um, root beer in Jaro, which was the PK Hindu Afi. Then I kept a clone out of that that leaned really hard to the candelabra mall. And, um, and then I wound up, um, I wound up seeding that, f 2 it, taking a mail out of it and putting it onto the cherry pie. And then, did I F to it? I didn't F to it. I took the candelabra cross OG coffee one and I took a mail straight out of that without F2 in it. And then I put that on the cherry. And then I took out of that a mail and put that on the cherry again. And then out of that, my mom grew some and I grew some and she got one that was really early. And I got one that had the candelabra smell and she got one that had the candelabra smell. And mine was pretty good, but hers finished September 10th and was super chunky and it was so loud and flavorful. And that's the Cherry West Mom. And then I took that and I hit it with a cherry limeade male. And then I bred it back and I bred it back and I bred it back and I bred it back. And, it back. and, uh, and that is what that, that's what those are. And so a lot of them have like I picked a male out of the back cross three that was more of an outlier and it carried a little bit more of the cherry side to where a lot of them have less terpenaline but they still have a good amount in, in some of them and um, it, uh, some of them finish really early uh, a good percentage of them are like more like the OGKB look with the weird leaf from the cherry pie and they are more narrow and they grow slower. And when I see those, you can see them when they're this big. I take those and I usually finish them out in smaller pots. And if I was gonna breed this one forward, you know, if for people who wanna do it, I would put together the, the bigger ones. And then you can also put together the smaller ones. The bigger ones might carry that, but the smaller ones definitely do. So if you breed the, the they'll all be that, you know? Um, but uh yeah that's they're 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 pretty bomb dude that's dope <clears throat> the cherry terpene dude i have not um uh, tried it and just so you know 420 chong heads he's out in the uk he's friends with beanstalk genetics and he took your cherry west i'm sure you probably know about this and crossed it to the baba kush which is a kush coming out of tira you know from an old man out there so it's this dope action like we're talking about this and it's his his stock, so it's like that selected. It's not this feral thing, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you say Baba Kush? That's what they called it, the Baba Kush. Like to say Baba is like saying uncle, or you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Respect something like see this. If I can find this really quick. Uh, Are you looking it up? I'm just looking up a funny, a funny, uh, funny message. Let me see. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No um. Worries. But yeah, yeah, the, the Cherry West is, is people have really liked it. The only people who don't like it, if they hate terpenaline, they don't like it sometimes, but I feel like maybe they didn't, they don't finish it and smoke it. Cause if you finish it and smoke it, you're like, oh, okay. This is, uh, <laughs> this is, this is not what I expected, you know? No, it's wild. I remember when he gave me root beer seeds, dude, and I grew those out. This was years ago, man, before anybody had root beer. Uh, yeah. That was so freaking cool, dude. Um, and it's cool to see that she's still making her rounds. Um, as far as like what's going to be available on the website, it's going to be these two strains here. And then the last one that I have that's more like on the the just one-of-a-kind tip, you know, like the Chem 91 Hindu, is this pink champagne Hindu. Oh yeah, that I I'm I that one's real promising to me. The pink champs is not the same as the original. That's why I abbreviated a little bit just so you know it's different. It's um it's a bag seed that um that 
the homie uh, Eastbourne West Grown found. He found it and he popped it and he gave me the clone years ago. And I was like, wow, this is pretty killer. And everybody who I've given the flower to really liked it, you know? Um, it's uh, it's just, it's a, it's a super cool, super cool um, plant and uh, it gets tons of resin. It's very potent and it smells really nice. Um, it kind of smells like a less fruity Skittles, if that makes sense. And, uh, it, um, it's just, it, it's a really nice one. And so it, it's kind of squat like the Hindu and, um, it has a look outdoor where it almost looks like it's indoor. It's very shiny and pretty and bright green and just coated and cocooned in resin. It's really, really good. So, yeah and they should and and it should a, a lot of those should probably like be washers where they'll make good hash too so that's another thing about the hindu is the hindu is straight it's a straight it's a hash plant you know you can wash the hindu it's just like cool because there's only so many plants that everybody uses that wash and hindu is like one that's not being used by anybody to make any hash and so um it's a new thing to inject into into the scene to find new um new hash plants so that one right there could be one that's cool you were just saying the the uh the uh baba kush the baba kush but you said the baba kush right baba b-a-b-a -B -A, yeah this is from 42723 this is a this is a uh this is a guy no he's a he's a, a jamaican a jamaican dancehall guy right he sent me this he said my Baba Kush. He said I was here and I was thinking about Bubba Kush and he said, you know what? No, I was thinking Baba Kush instead of Bubba Kush. Because like in Jamaica they have they have like a roots that they call Baba Baba roots. It's a roots tonic. It's like the most famous roots tonic, you know, that people drink there. It's like a like a health drink, you know? And um you said Baba Kush and I was like, Oh shit, okay, it's already it's already taken. That's how the name game goes, you know. But it was funny because that that little that little chunk uh, from Roundhead, you know, he's he's like, oh, the but the the Baba Kush, I'm like, oh, that's how it goes. Sorry, rounds, it's gone, you know. Well, dude, I was in Jamaica, and so <clears throat> it's really hot and humid, as you know. And what's your perspective? I think the weed that I got was from a dispensary, and just like you'd go to a dispensary here, you're not guaranteed the good shit. Um, <clears throat> the weed that I brought with me was definitely better. Um, how, how would you talk about like, cause Jamaica's known for weed, right? Um, how can you talk about the reality of growing in these, tr in this, uh, kind of environment and how to get the chronic still to be grown in Jamaica? Yeah. So the original weed that came, I don't have my charger in here on my thing. It's I'm, I'm only at 5%. So we might have a, an abrupt dropout out here, but maybe we, maybe we'll wrap it off here. If I, if I can keep from, from cutting out. So in, um, in Jamaica, the weed that originally showed up was from India and the people who still have it out in the country, they call it the Indian and it's made to grow in places like that. So, it just naturally wants to grow there and it won't die in the droughts and everything and it won't rot in the rainy season. And then they brought in all the modern stuff and it didn't do as well, but it did well in certain places there. So now most of the weed all comes from um, the west side of the island where it's like pretty easy to grow and they can grow most everything there. Maybe like short indicas need a little supplemental light to keep them from budding too fast. But, um, but you, you can grow really, really good weed there. Um, and it, they'd be better off growing the things like the original Indian, that, which is like straight land race sativa with thin buds and long flowering time that doesn't want to bud right away because they're so far south. Things want to flower 
because they're like on like a 12 and 12, you know? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so that's basically the, um, that's basically the, uh, you know, the, the trip down there. It's, it's mostly a matter of like the know-how if they have a good place to dry it out of the sun. And, um, and it's like being in the right, right areas. And then if you're in the areas where it's more challenging and wet, then you really need to have those things that were originally from, you know, um, India, or I'm sure you could pull off like things that are like Thai and Colombian and stuff like that. But what has happened a lot is that they've started growing what back in the day, like what they call the skunk, which is just like the more thicker leaf stuff brought from California and Amsterdam. And, um, now it's out there um in the west where they really you know a lot of the weed used to come from like uh saint anne's and that that uh is like uh more on the north of the island and like all islands have kind of a there's a thing that happens where the south and the west i think because naturally because the whole island tends to be like a southwest face those are like the dry side and the north and the east because they're like the shady side because of the way the sun is if you're on a mountain in mendo you're like you want to be on the southwest side and it's dry and sunny if you're on the northeast side that's where you look for mushrooms because it's dark and shady right well every island that's not really huge it's kind of like just one big hill and so if you're in the northern hemisphere then the south and the west in the big island that's kona in Maui, that's Lahaina and Kihei because it's shaped like an ape, so it has two hills. Um, if you're in, you know, if you're in Kauai, then it's like, you know, that then that, that south, you know, Polahale, uh, Poipu, like that's like the southwest. That's where it's the dry side. So every island's like that. In Jamaica, is the same way. So the wet side of the island used to grow a lot of the weed. But that was because it was the real Jamaican weed that didn't yield as well and everything, but it could do really well in that remote part of the island um, where it was very green and you could just plant a whole hill and the whole thing would just look green, you know. And then, um, you know, once they got, one, once things took off more, then it's like, you know, if you listen to like old music from back in the day, um, they'll, they'll mention like St. Anne's and weed there, but they'll also talk about the West. But if you listen to newer stuff, they'll only talk about the West because it's just like the modern stuff. It grows better where it's, uh, the, 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 the hotter, drier side of the Island, you know? Absolutely, man. <clears throat> and it's been such a rich conversation and, uh, you know, I'm selfish, so I want to keep going. I know you got 5%, man, and I know, you know, you've been sitting with me for a minute. I think rather than at the risk of it just dropping off mid-sentence, I think I want to say thank you, and um, I appreciate your time, man, and, and anything else you may want to say, you know, I think we should probably close out. It's probably a good time. Um, yeah, man. I mean, you know, my apologies for going introspective on the weed podcast and shit, you know. No, it's um, great. This is great. You know, it's cool. All mental breakdown maybe not really but you know what i mean uh, no. uh and um you know fucking yeah I don't, I don't know man like uh that was you like, had fun right it was good it was all good i had fun man i had my couple uh i had my little shot of um my little shot of fucking overproof and and uh you know a little small time party in here and um you know just chilling man yeah it's great Thanks everybody for um, for checking it out, and uh, you know it was fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. I just I would hate for it to cut off mid sense. You know, I'm not sure how much time you have. Uh, <clears throat> I want to say thank you for again these few packs that are going to be available on La Paz International Seed Bank. And uh, my last question is: people always ask about your merch. What's the deal with your merch? Um. They can, um, if uh, they really want, they can um, buy your hat that you're wearing. And uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's, there's, there's only like a couple of those left. And what I'm gonna do is get another wave of um, 
another wave of hats done and what I'll, I'll probably do is I'll probably do some that are more like this one and a little more um, straightforward and simple and then I'll get another one that's done that's the crazy ones like that that's all the pimped out shit and um, you know they'll, they'll, they'll be available in a while I'm planning on doing that pretty soon and you know I need to get another run of some cool shirts and stuff at the moment I don't really have the new any of the new stuff but I have been designing it uh, with my buddy Joey, a sticker farmer, we got some like some files made up and everything, and I just need to uh, basically pull the trigger and decide exactly which ones I want to do, and um, and there'll be some stuff going, yeah, for sure. Dope, dope, Jackson. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can't thank you enough, man, and um, it's so cool. Uh, this is again big highlight. I've been waiting for this, you know, so. Um, good looking out and I'll, I'll see you when the time's right, man. I'll run into you sooner or later and yeah, we'll man. do it again in, in the coming months, dude, for, for sure. sure, dude. Uh, and I appreciate you having me on and, uh, I especially appreciate anybody who hung in for four hours of, um, crazy rants of a fucking, you know, old weed head from the fucking woods, you know? Like, we got you. You yeah. revealed parts of yourself, dude. I don't know if you ever talked about some of this stuff publicly. Oh no, no, definitely not, man. You know that's why. Yeah. That's why. That's why I should have smoked way more weed. But you know, fucking a. Mission yeah. accomplished, bro. Love yeah, you, yeah. man. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll hit you up, bro, for sure. Right on, fucking a. All right, peace, man. Peace. Peace.